Welcome to another full story right here at Comic Storian. A full story is basically us taking a lot of our older videos that have been broken up over months, years, and weeks as we were creating them, and we put them together into a giant video for you. Now, this series is known as Wolverine Goes to Hell. At least that's what Marvel basically calls it. It was a couple different writers and a couple different directions to the character of Wolverine. Now, we basically took the series known as Wolverine Goes to Hell, and we put it together as a story for you. So I hope you guys enjoy this Wolverine basically coming back, fighting against the X-Men, and then going on a journey to fix a lot of the things in his life. Our story begins with a young girl coming to the Howlett Estate, a building that has been said to have been built on tears. The oldest of the Howlett family took ill as soon as the building was completed, and he died. And the tragedy sent poor Mrs. Howlett to the madhouse since her return, and she's never been the same. The grandfather of the family is someone to be avoided as he is a self-made millionaire coming from a fortune in copper. And he is just not a pleasant person to be around. And our young girl? Well, her name is Rose, and she's coming to the manor to be a companion for young James Howlett. She lost both her parents to influenza, and she was recommended to this position by a friend of the family. The driver who brought her to the home and warned her about all of the tragedies in the family warned her that if she wanted to make it to age 13, she should keep to herself and do as she's told. This isn't a family to be trifled with. Upon arriving, Rose met Dog, who threw dirt in her face. He was the son of the groundskeeper, Thomas Logan. A bad apple if you ever saw one, according to the maid staff. Every day, she would keep James company, reading him books and playing in the yard with him and living on the estate. Most of the family was nice to her, though she did never see Mistress Elizabeth as she always stayed away from everyone, and the old man was a cruel old buzzard. James's father, John, though, he was a nice man. The three children in total on the estate, Dog, James, and Rose, they were all friends. Though as much fun as they had, James had conditions. Like he couldn't be out in the sun very long and water would make his skin blotchy. But after all of their fun, James and Rose would go back to the estate, while Dog would go back to his life down below. One day while playing, James fell into the nearby pond, and Dog had to jump in and save him. The boys then went back to James's house so that they could let their parents sort out what exactly had happened. And while James's father, John, told Thomas Logan that it was okay, there were no problems. The old man in his grumpy nature insisted that Thomas Logan and his child be punished. John wouldn't have it though, and he let them both head home. But that night, Dog was punished by his father, a lesson that he needed to learn. That their kind and the people on the top of the hill don't mix. Some time passed and winter came. James hadn't seen Dog since the incident at the pond, but when he finally saw him at the hedge maze, he chased after him, hoping to catch up. But Dog vanished. Christmas then came, and on Boxing Day, Dog was caught spying into the home. So John gave Dog one of James's presents, much to the old man's displeasure. The old man and John got into an argument over how to treat the help, while Thomas sat down in the town down below, getting drunk on the holiday. John didn't deserve that manner. He didn't deserve his life. He didn't even know how to treat his wife. As he stumbled back in his drunken stupor, Dog came running up to him to let him know about the toy that John had given him. So Thomas felt that Dog needed to be punished. And that was their lives. Years began to pass, and after Rose stumbled into a room that she shouldn't have been in and got kicked out of the house temporarily, she ran into Dog. But Dog wanted her. He felt he deserved her, that she was his, even if she didn't agree. James saw this happening, and he told Rose not to worry. He'll get father. And once James left, she knocked Dog out herself, but the damage was done. James had told his father, and John brought the issue up to Thomas Logan, telling him to fix this. He wouldn't stand for this type of behavior on his property. He needed to get his boy in line. Later that night, when James was all alone with his pet dog, Callie, Dog showed up. He told James that he shouldn't have ratted him out, and he jumped on him, asking him where his father is now. Who would protect him? Callie grabbed Dog's leg and chewed it up. So Dog turned around and sliced Callie open. John was furious. He had warned Thomas Logan to get his boy into check. And because of this, he had both Thomas and Dog thrown off the property and fired. But Thomas wasn't done with the Howlett family. As he arrived back at his home, Dog was fearful that he'd be beaten. But Thomas told him that John didn't deserve that pretty wife of his. And he intended to fix it this time. They broke into the property and they took Rose hostage, forcing her to let them inside of the manor. Thomas then broke into Mistress Elizabeth's room and then John arrived to find out what's going on. This woke up James and he walked into the room just in time to watch his father have his brains blown out by Thomas. He ran to his father's side and they began to shout for everyone to shut up! They can't think! It wasn't supposed to go down like this! So Dog went to shoot James because he wouldn't stop crying and Rose pushed the gun out of the way. 
James then got up, hitting Dog across the face, and he ran over to Thomas Logan, shouting, You killed my papa! He punched him in the stomach, and then Thomas knocked him over. But Thomas quickly realized that he was bleeding heavily from his gut, and he fell over, dying. Everyone looked at James to see him screaming in pain as bone claws protruded from his hands. As James asked what was going on, why can't he feel his hands, his mother walked over and slapped him. Not again! James begged for his mother not to do this, but she called him a monster and demanded that he leave the house. Rose chased after him and Dog cried out in pain over this, and James's mother went over and held Thomas in her arms, sad at what she had caused. She then grabbed the rifle and ended her own life, leaving Dog in the room all alone, unable to see. Rose fled the area, taking James with her, and they hid in the nearby barn. And James finally woke up and asked if he even knows Rose. He asked her if she could smell the apple dumplings that he could smell, but they seemed so far away. And then he mentioned that he could hear people walking by the servant's entrance, and that he could hear three people in the maze, and that he was having the worst dream ever. He then asked for his mother, but Rose realized that something was wrong and asked him, Don't you remember what happened? And her name was Rose. He told her that he remembered now. Doesn't she work for his father? Meanwhile, as the police arrived at the home, Dog was the only one left there and he informed them of what had happened. Rose had a gun and she killed everyone. Rose then took James to her aunt's house, but her aunt informed her that the police were after her for murder and kidnapping, and she wouldn't have anything to do with it, leaving Rose and James to flee in the snow alone. They went to the old man's cabin on the Howlett property, where Rose begged him to hear her out and take in his grandson. But the old man wanted nothing to do with James, and as far as he was concerned, the last of his line died in the murder tonight. He had no grandson. So he gave Rose money and he told her to take the boy to the train station. And he warned that if he ever saw them on the property again, he would have them both shot. The two of them were on their own and they fled the area. The whole time, James's mind wasn't right. He didn't fully understand what was going on until eventually, Rose brought him to the logging camp. She begged for work for the two of them and introduced them as Rose and Logan. Their time there was odd, because James was distant, like he was trying to block the memories of what had happened to his father. And he had problems with the people at the camp. The cook in particular would shorten their rations, which led James to learn how to hunt and get his own food. As the years went by, James started to accept that his name was Logan and that he had become a hunter. Rose asked where this hunting urge had come from and he told her he really didn't know. It was just an urge that he did have. And then he told her to never call him James again because their lives before here were gone. This was their life now. Time would go on and the cook would constantly cause problems for Logan until the leader of the camp, Smitty, told him to stand up for himself. Logan couldn't do it though. He couldn't fight against the cook. And just when the cook was about to finish off Logan, the camp leader, Smitty, saved his butt. Terrified, Logan ran off into the woods where he found himself surrounded by wolves. And that's when something awoke in Logan that night. He popped his claws ready to fight, but instead he fell to the ground and the wolves accepted him. Time would pass and after a while he found himself pushed to his limits and he took control of the pack of wolves. But back at the Howlett Manor, the old man was finally getting on in his age and he realized his mistakes. So he asked the boy that he took as his heir to find his grandson and bring him home. And Dog Logan agreed. Back at the camp, Logan and the cook eventually got to work out their differences in a cage match, with Logan's new nickname being chanted, Wolverine! 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 He finally conquered the man that was holding him back emotionally, and then Smitty, the camp owner, came over and told Logan that he was leaving him as the foreman to the camp, so he can start a new life with Rose. You see, during this time when Logan was distant and trying to figure himself out, Smitty was getting close to Rose and he's now decided that he wanted to start a new life with her. He wanted to live with her away from this. Logan told Smitty that he always loved Rose, so if Smitty ever did anything to her, he'd be answering to Logan. And with that, Smitty and Logan parted ways on good terms. Everyone is gonna be happy. Rose was gonna have Smitty, Logan was gonna be the new foreman, and no one was gonna challenge him anymore. And that's when Dog arrived, shouting, You stole my name! Logan's memory was all repaired though, and he didn't remember anything from before, so he didn't remember Dog and Dog proceeded to beat him down. But this just pushed Logan to his breaking point again, and once again, something snapped at him. He got up and he began beating Dog back, dropping him with ease. And then he popped his claws, just as Rose came running over. Logan, no, she shouted, as he went in to stab Dog, and he raised his claws, prepared to go through with it. She fell on them. Logan stared in shock as Rose died right there, and with her, any chance that Logan may remember his original life as James Howlett. His mind had healed over the trauma and therefore healed over all of his bad memories. He ran into the forest that night and Smitty chased after him, begging him to come back to help him through the loss of Rose. 
But this is another thing that Logan was going to heal over. Another thing that he would forget. And he wandered off into the forest to live with the wolves for years. It was 1907 in the Canadian wilderness. A pack of wolves chased down a deer, and just as it passes by a tree, Logan bursts out of the ground. His claws stab into the deer's flesh and the wolves just watch. The pack leader is Grayscar, and together he hunts with his three sons, and one just as close as any son that he's ever had, the Wolfish Man. Along with the one called Red Streak, Logan lives among this family of wolves, accepted just like one of their own kind. Though it is rare for a wolf family to accept one that isn't of their own blood, rare is not never. However, there is one wolf that isn't a part of the pack. The lone wolf is different. He watches, he waits, he desires, but it is not family that he desires. He wants what the family has. One night as the pack heads out on another hunt, they head through the woods to find something strange, a polar bear. This is not that bear's home. And though the wolves knew not to anger the bear, Logan had to know more. For the first time in years, he felt pity. For as strange as the bear was to the forest, the forest was strange to it as well. As Logan watches the great white bear, he even went as far as to bring the bear gifts of food. However, what the bear needed was flesh, and flesh Logan couldn't spare. With that, the days passed, and the day was spent with the family and the nights were for the hunting. Life continued and nothing changed until one day, Red Streak's howl cut through the night's air, and that's when everything changed. Logan heard the call and he rushed back to the cave and his brothers were running ahead of him. He underestimated the stranger who lurked in their woods, and as Logan ran, he learned that the bear would soon find its way home. But now, his home. The bear stands tall, holding the lifeless pups with blood dripping from its mouth, and all Logan could see was red. For a moment, he couldn't comprehend what he was looking at, and then he did. He screamed as the claws popped out, and he lunged at the bear, but with its giant stature, it smacked him to the ground. The bear made his way over, and just as he looms over Logan, Logan jumps up, burying his claws into the bear's chest. The bear once again knocks Logan away, partly breaking the bone claws. As Logan tries to ease the pain in his hand, the bear leaps onto him, sinking his teeth into his neck. With a firm tug, the bear rips a chunk out of Logan's neck and he spits it to the ground, signaling Logan's defeat. The bear then looks at Logan's body and he begins to walk off, and just before the chunk of flesh can fall onto the white snow, he too falls in defeat. The once pure white snow is now covered with the blood of the pack, Logan and the bear. And as the steam rises from the meat tossed aside, the lone wolf walks by and bites into it. The lone wolf then moves to the great bear having a taste, and then he notices the one thing that he wanted, Logan. Before the wolf has a chance to even react, though, Logan punches the wolf in the forehead with his good claw, breaking through the skull. Logan gets up, watching his wounds heal, knowing that this life is over. His second chance at living vanished. He once lived as a man. He once lived as a wolf, as both the wolfish man found only woe in them. As he screamed into the night, a glint of metal could be seen on the bear's nose, and the tag read, Subject 2, Essex. The next day, a man tells his dogs to stop barking or they're going to get the stick again. A woman tells him to just stop it. That won't calm them down as she kneels down before the dog, quietly telling him to shush, and she starts to pet one of the dogs. The dogs begin to bark, and the man says, That was incredible. You're good with animals. The woman turns back, showing the part of her disfigured face, saying, So she's been told. Another man named Hugo walks over telling Clara that they don't have time for this, they're here for business. And Clara says that he does know that the business is the animals. Hugo then says, speaking of animals, where is her bay? Clara tells him that there are too many people here. If he uses that word to describe him again, she'll cut him. As the group heads into the saloon, Hugo pays one of the patrons, stating that his information better be worth it. The man says that it's worth every cent. And he goes on to say that when him and his compatriot were tracking a polar bear, they did find it in fact dead. It was torn to bits, and when they examined the wounds, they could see that whatever killed it was not just an animal, but something big. As Hugo looks at the maps and the charts, he asks, How do I know that these aren't faked? And another voice says, Consider this. Would I have traveled to the lowest pit on God's own earth to silence one of my employees if his flapping tongue was speaking of something he shouldn't? Everyone turns to see an extravagant, well-groomed man, and the patron says that it has nothing to do with you, Dr. Essex. Essex pulls out his pocket watch, and he tells Hugo and his group that he doesn't know who they are. But it's time for them to leave. Clara tells him that from what she hears, it's not a man that they need to be worried about out there. But before anyone could argue any further, a scruffy man pushes his way through Essex's men, telling Clara and Hugo that it's best that they move. Hugo tells Essex that he may have expensive toys and men. However, I have Mr. Creed. The best, and Victor Creed walks over telling him, 
tracker. Just an everyday working tracker who thinks his fool of a boss should get moving while there's light outside. As Hugo and the rest leave, Essex turns back to the patron. And he tells him, I do not believe I wanted any of my business sold to any hunter. This is an experiment, and any results are mine and mine alone. Later, Essex stares down at the frozen body of the man who talked, and he says, I suppose it's my fault. Should have been more clear on the penalties of disobedience. He turns back to his men and he shouts, Well, let's get out there. Let the hunt begin. Essex's men begin to put on gas masks, and they start to throw gas into the location of where he is supposed to be. Everyone watches to see any movement, but before Essex could even say what, Logan has torn through most of the marauders. Everyone aims their gun at him, and Essex tells them to hold. It's a man, a mutant at last. Elsewhere in the forest, Creed follows Logan's scent, and he tells everyone that there is a cave entrance hidden nearby. He's gone to ground. Hugo says, are you sure? And Creed tells him, I treat you and Clara pretty well considering, but if you ever question me about what I do again, I'll open you up from cross to neck. A short while later, everyone arrives at a pile of branches, and Creed tells one of the guys to go poke it. Just as the man walks up, Logan leaves out of the brush, cutting away at the man with animalistic rage. Clara runs through the group shouting for Logan to stop. Just stop! And Logan looks at her for a moment and she says, There you go. There's no need to kill anyone. It's going to be alright. He pauses for a moment and then a rope is thrown around his arm and he's yanked back. His body flies through the air and Clara shouts for Creed to stop, but as Logan falls to the ground, Creed kicks his face, telling him, That's where making eyes at Clara. Before Creed can kick again, Clara shouts for him to stop! And she shows her teeth. While Clara and Creed argue, Hugo breaks them up, stating that that's enough. They will see what they've come so far from civilization for. With Logan tied up, Clara says that he's not an animal, he's a man, and Hugo says, he's an animal man. Oh, I see it now. Welcome to Hugo the Great's phantasmagorical celebration of the strange and the wonderful. Without further delay, let me introduce you to the Claude Man of the Woods, the marvel of the modern age. After Hugo's show, Clara walks up to Logan's cage and tells him that it could have all been stopped if he would just talk. What they're doing to him isn't right. Logan stares at her, thinking back to what happened when he was younger. What happened at the cave? And he remains silent. Frustrated, Clara says, Not a word. Great. You're really not being helpful here. She throws her hands up, telling him, Fine. You're strong as hell. But they're going to keep shocking you to make those claws come out. Do you really want to die? He thinks back to all of the things that he's lost, and he remains quiet. And Clara reaches out, telling him, Please. The moment her hand gets close, Logan growls, popping his claws, and then he's hit with the electrical shock. Standing next to a smoking battery, Creed tells Clara that she's a damn fool. He's saving her from her soft hearted nature. Clara says with everything that he's been through, she'd think that he'd be kinder, and Creed looks at the cage and says, You know what I think? Better him than me. As the days go on, Hugo shows his marvelous wonders to the crowds, but one day, Essex is in that crowd. He watches as they shock Logan, forcing him to bring out his claws, and he waits. After the show, he stands outside of Hugo's cart, hearing how Clara is yelling what they're doing is inhumane. Hugo says that they can't stop now, this is saving the circus, they need the money. And Essex knocks on that moment, and he says that he couldn't help it over here. If money is an issue, I would pay handsomely for the beast. Clara snaps, telling him he is not for sale. And Hugo says, she's right, take those Prussian pounds or whatever and leave. Meanwhile, back in the tent, Creed awakens from a drunken nightmare and he sees Logan watching him. Creed shouts that he doesn't know anything about him. How he was treated like an animal, like property. First chance I had, I got out of my cage. No one's gonna put me back into that one again, except half the time when I close my eyes. I'm there again. Logan doesn't say anything, and Creed gets up shouting, Stop looking at me, runt! But before he can press the shock button, Clara steps in, telling Creed to get back to his car. Now! She looks at Logan and says Creed just breaks her heart. She then puts her hand on the cage, holding Logan's hand, telling him, And you do too. The next day, Hugo's reading the paper, which states that his show is a hoax, and then there's a knock at the car. Hugo steps out, telling Essex, I'm not selling! And Essex stops him, telling him, you misunderstand. What I'm suggesting is you allow me to do an experiment on him. That way I can speak for you and prove your show isn't fake. Hugo waits for a moment, and then he says, I come with the Savage, along with the best men in my company. Essex says, whatever makes you feel more comfortable. Later at Essex's lab, Logan is strapped to the table when Essex begins to turn on the gas. The room fills and he puts on his mask and he says, I know the Savage can survive this, but humans, not so much. After looking at his pocket watch, he waits for the gas to take effect on Hugo and his men, killing them. And then he turns on the vents to clear it out, stating, It was a sin to suggest that you were a fake to the press, but I had to do what was needed. He then picks up a scalpel and says, Now, let me make amends to science. Back at the circus, Clara runs over to Creed, shouting that Hugo and a bunch of men have taken the Wolfman to Essex. Creed then shouts while whittling a piece of wood, stating, And? And she tells him, We need to find him. And Creed says, No, you need to find him. You need to go get him. I'm not an idiot. I know you're falling for him. You're gonna leave me. Clara says, No, nothing will ever change between us. I love you. I would never leave after everything, please. Over at Essex's lab, Essex cuts into Logan, watching his broken bones mend back together, reforming the muscle and then patch itself together. 
He washes up, stating, I'm surprised you survived. Vivisection, in my experience, is universally fatal. He hands over a small vial, and then the man drinks it, falling over as he finishes. More of Essex men come in to drag the body away, and Essex says that when we see you again, you'll be an Ubermensch, a perfect soldier for a perfect war. As Essex leaves, he tells Logan that nature has made you more wonderful, and I will make you complete. As the lights go out, Clara and Creed open up the doors and sneak into the lab. She lifts the blanket over Logan and tells Creed that he heals better than even you. Logan's eyes shoot open and he tries to form words, and a faint run can be heard. And Clara smiles, telling him, you don't mean that. And then she holds his hand. He looks at them and he says, help. Then a few moments later, the three escape the facility. A month later in New York, Logan and Clara stand in front of a butcher shop and Clara tells Logan that it's all right, he can do it. He walks in and he says, so, so, sausages, a pound of sausages. The butcher wraps them up and Logan leaves the money telling him, thank you. As he walks out, Clara says, see, I knew you could do it. And then the butcher steps out. He taps Logan on the shoulder, telling him that he forgot his change and instinctively Logan spins around, popping his claws. Later at the motel, Creed says, Here's a pen for the new pet. In between the board and paying for the sausages, that's the last of our money. We don't even have the sausages. Logan says, I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. I'm a broken animal. And Clara says, no, we should be so lucky. You've been trained to do this and we can train you not to. However, I know you're in pain. And what is it that pains you so much? Logan thinks back to his previous lives and Clara asks, what is it that you're not talking about? He tries to form words, but he can't, and Creed says, Maybe Essex has the right idea. If the pain hurts so much, take one of his potions, and you'll have no more feeling or problems. Clara snaps back that maybe you should be the one to take a damned potion then. Creed snarls and storms out of the room, leaving the two there. And later that night, as Logan and Clara sleep, Logan begins to have nightmares, and he wakes up screaming, taking out his claws. He looks at Clara as she wakes up and says that he's sorry. Clara tells him, That's okay. I'm used to sharing rooms with people who have bad dreams, but come over here and tell me what's going on. He sits down on the bed, and he wishes that it could be that damn simple. He ran away from home with Rose, a, a girl. He loved her. She stumbled and just as he turned, his claws came out and she was there. He had to run. He didn't want to be a man anymore. And he found a life with the wolves. The story of Rose is Wolverine Origins 1. The link will be down below and you can find it on the channel. When Essex Bear came, it all ended for them as well. He tried to end it, but he can't die. In a few hours, he just heals from everything. Clara then holds up a hand covering one side of her face, telling him, life is pain. And she holds up another hand covering the other side and finishes telling him, but it's not all that life is. The pain is the price, and the price is worth paying for. She reaches out and she kisses Logan, and he pushes her back, asking, what about Creed? She tells him it's not what he thinks, they're not like that. She'll explain everything in the morning. And as the two lay down, Creed watches from the outside. Later that night, Logan wakes up and says they found us. And seconds later, Essex Ubermensch kick in the door and Logan goes feral. The men try to shock Logan, but from the times he was shocked in the circus, it has very little effect. He begins cutting and tearing through them and Clara runs and telling him that they have to, but he turns and as he swings, he stabs into Clara's chest. Few moments go by and Clara touches Logan's face, telling him, it's all right, it's all right, don't. Logan's vision begins to blur and everything that he sees and has been through begins to happen all over again. All he can see is red. He is red, the room is red, everything is red, and moments later, Creed steps in, seeing Clara, and shouts, No, no, no! He picks up her body, telling Logan, We never agreed on anything, uh, but I think it's time that we go cut ourselves a slice of revenge. As the two run outside, Logan says, I loved her. And Creed says, Everyone she ever met loved her. You wouldn't believe the hell that we'd been through together. Back inside, Clara's body begins to breathe, and she opens up her eyes, gasping for air. Creed finishes by stating, Clara was the best sister a guy could ever wish for. Later, just outside of New York, the two men arrive at Essex's home and lab, and Creed says they're gonna sneak in, find Essex, and kill him for Clar. Logan thinks back to seeing her lifeless body, and rather than answer Creed, he charges in, claws ready. Through the mines in the ground and the hailstorm of bullets, Logan continues to run until he manages to get over the compound wall. Once over, the Uber wrench surrounds him, and he lets the feral beast within him out. Creed hops over the wall, telling him, that's a good start, partner. As the two get inside, Creed says that they'll split up, and whoever finds him kills him. Logan then says, do you wanna be there? And Creed says, no, I don't care who does it, just get it done. The two search the castle, and as the door to Essex's chamber swings open, Logan stands there. Essex says, I had learned so much from our few samples of you. A war is coming. Do you not know how many people are going to die? Logan asks, right now, just one. Clara is dead. Essex says, ah, I didn't know. Though I didn't care for some silly little girl. I did promise Creed that she wouldn't be hurt. Logan stops mid-step, and Essex says, you didn't know? Creed is the one who said where you were. A fool played to the end. Played. But before he can finish his sentence, Logan drives his claws into Essex's chest, tossing him out the window. Over in another part of the mansion, Creed stares at a cauldron of the potion. And Logan says, It was you to blame for all of this! 
Creed tells him, no, I'm not. We are fine without you. Logan then retracts his claws and he runs beating Creed into the ground with his fists. Creed leans up bloody nose, pulling out a tooth, stating, who cares? Killing me won't fill that hole. Clara's dead. Clara reminded me why I want to live. Maybe the both of us should just knock back a bottle of this stuff and forget everything. Logan looks at the beakers of the potion and Creed says, it makes no difference. Make me drink and kill me. It's all the same. We're the same. Just end it. Before Logan could do anything, Clara walks in with a gun, stating, she never thought that she would rather her mother have kept the afterbirth than her brother. Logan drops the beaker, asking, how? But Clara walks in, pushing Creed back, telling her, I was going to tell you. I'm gifted like you. All the Creed kids are. Where I got my knack with animals and Creed here got the wolf boy crap. Logan asks, but then what about your face? And Clara stops him, telling him, Creed dripped acid on it. Turns out after an afternoon with it, it sticks. Needed to find out if there was a limit. Creed shouts, she told me to. She said it was okay. And Clara yells, I know. This just makes me wish I hadn't. Creed tries to say that he was doing it for her, and Clara stops him, telling him, You don't get it, I love Logan. And Creed says, I mean it. If I can't have you in my life, life's not worth two cents. I'm gonna drink Essex Elixir if I have to be alone. Logan thinks back to when he saw the lone wolf, and he tells Creed, Maybe you should. With that, Logan charges at Creed, and though Creed swipes back, Logan holds his head in the cauldron. Clara screams for him to stop or she's going to shoot, and Logan keeps his hands under, telling her, Do what you have to do. The gun goes off, but Logan doesn't loosen his grip until Creed stops moving. Clara pulls his body out, and while she tries to revive him, Logan says, It was for the best. He would have killed us. I had to protect us. And she shouts, I said I didn't want anything to do with him, not to try and murder him. Even still, he was my brother. She gets up telling Logan, Just get the hell out of here, or you're gonna have to kill me too. He reaches out, but Clara pulls away, telling him, Go! And as Clara looks at Creed, she says, Though the animal rage was a sickness, I could have helped. But really, the problem was the man. The man that he was was a damn cold-blooded killer. Sure, he can heal, but it would have been better for everyone if he didn't. And Logan looks at Clara one last time and walks out, never to see her again. He walks out of the compound, thinking what he thought of Essex Bear. He wanted so badly to be the Grey Wolf. However, in his heart, he always felt like the Lone Wolf. The truth, though? He was something much, much worse. Deep in the forest, John Wraith sits with Logan at his church as he tells him that there are two types of hell. The actual hell, and the hell that they create for themselves, which he's pretty sure he knows plenty about. John goes on to state that the important thing to remember is that even back in their Weapon X days, they're not victims, they were born killers. Logan asks, when is this supposed to get easier? And John tells him, well, it doesn't. Logan then says, with everything going on in this world, our enemies defeated, everything in the world is right again. Except that's never the case. The thing I'm worried about is not carrying the darkness in me. It's the hope. John tells him having faith and hope are fragile things. But is it the faith being broken that worries him? Or being rewarded when it does? Three weeks pass. John gives service and notices Logan isn't in the crowd, which is strange. But as the service goes on, a man runs in shouting that him and his wife were attacked. The man just cut through the entire house like it was nothing. John looks at the woman's arm where she was cut, and he sees three distinct claw marks. He tells the crowd to stay in the church, he's gonna go find out what's going on. And outside, he heads to the shed behind the church where he keeps his weapons cache. He starts loading up when he hears an explosion in the distance. John runs through the woods and he sees something, and it charges forward, knocking him to the ground. A hooded man stands over him, and John tells him that he's not going to beg if that's what he wants. And then bugs start to crawl over John's face, and he begins to scream. The hooded man walks back to the church, and as he gets back to the doors, he spits acid on the steps, and suddenly, they burst into flames. The fire starts to climb the building, and John runs into the woods telling him to stop. As John grabs him, he feels several claws stab into his stomach, and then he's tossed to the ground. John looks up and says, You can't be Logan, so who are you? The man pulls down the hood and asks, What do you see? Tell us. And John says, Hell. He sees hell. Over in San Francisco, Logan's girlfriend, Melita, begins finishing up a story that she was writing down when she hears the elevator doors ding. As the doors open, a security guard's body falls out with a knife in it, and with it, Gunhawk and his men step out, standing, find the woman. One of the larger men runs through the aisle, stating that he can smell her, and soon he looks over to cubicle and finds Melita. She reaches for her purse, firing a gun that Logan had given her, knocking the man away, and she starts running. The female of the group chases after her, and then suddenly there's a rev of an engine, and a woman rides a motorcycle through, slamming into her. Melita points her gun at the woman on the bike telling her to stay away and Mystique pulls the helmet off stating that if she wants to save herself and Logan hop on the bike she's here to help 
As Melita jumps on, the two escape and Gung Hawk reports that the woman escaped and Mystique helped her. The man tells them to just go ahead and proceed to their next target and then a woman says that Mystique has betrayed them. But the man tells her not to worry. When the time is right, they will deal with Mystique and Melita. Out on the streets of San Francisco, Melita tells Mystique to forgive her for, you know, not trusting her at all. But who were those people back there? Mystique says that they are people who hate her and her boyfriend Logan even more than she does. So Melita asks the big question, where's Logan? And Mystique says that that's not really an easy question because the questions are, where is his body and where is his soul? Down in the pits of hell, demons hold up Logan's body to the devil and the devil says that he's going to enjoy playing with his new toy. As time passes, Logan finds himself fighting off wave after wave of demons, all trying to wear him down. It could have been days, months, years, but either way, he can at least be himself here, and that's a killer. As Logan tears through the demons, he tells himself that he should be somewhat careful. His wounds are not healing as fast as they should be, and his claws are now bone instead of adamantium. As the last demon is cut down, the devil's voice can be heard laughing. <laughs> are you ready to give up yet? Because I have plenty more people who would love to see you. Logan looks at him and tells him, Keep them coming, bub. More demons appear, and all of the people that Logan has killed in his past appear. But that doesn't stop him as he rips through them all the same. The more of them that fall, the more appear. But there is one who really wishes to see Logan. A tendril claws out, grabbing Logan by the throat, and Omega Red tells him that he's going to make him suffer just like he did his old friend. But Logan grabs the tendril and flips Omega Red over and cuts through his torso. He screams out that they won't ever break me! And the demons continue coming, and they begin to overwhelm him. The devil begins to pull out a chain, telling Logan that he has so many more men who claimed the same thing. But every one of them is broken down, including Sabretooth here. Up in the real world, Mystique pulls over and Melita asks what exactly does she mean by Logan is in hell? Like the actual, literal hell? Melita takes her phone out and Mystique asks who's she gonna call. And she tells her that she's calling the X-Men. Mystique tells her don't do that. Her and the X-Men don't really mix well, so she calls them Count Mystique out. Elsewhere, a phone begins to ring, and Yukio picks it up telling whoever is on the line to speak. Melita says that they have a mutual friend who needs help, and Yukio tells her that Logan always has a habit of falling for helpless women. But what is it, helpless American female? Melita goes on stating that this might sound crazy, but... And then before she can go on, Yukio hears a creak, and then a man slashes where she's sitting. She fights back and she kicks the hooded man, and that's when she sees Logan's face dripping with blood. He holds out his arm, slamming Yukio into the ceiling, and then he brings her close. He holds out his claws and he stabs into her chest. Melita asks what's going on, and Logan picks up the phone, telling her, She's dead. Melita asks if it's him, and Logan tells her, Not anymore. The line then goes silent. Mystique looks back, telling her, Told you. And Melita asks, what are they supposed to do? But Mystique tells her, they wait for Damon and the Ghost Riders. Meanwhile, back in hell, Logan watches as the demons bring out Mariko. He says that he will do anything, just don't hurt her. And the devil tells him, oh no, I'm not going to hurt her. She's going to hurt you. One of the demons hands Mariko a barbed flail, and she tells Logan that she's sorry, and she whips him with the flail. The barbs tear into his back, and she tells him, please, just give in. He doesn't answer her, and he screams out in pain as the barbs continue to tear away at his flesh. Looking on, though, are two figures watching Logan's torture. The taller man says that he better not give in. If he does, the plan will go out the window. All he needs to do is talk to them. And the shorter man, Puck, steps out, stating that he's pretty sure he won't be having anything to do with them when he finds out who he is. But for now, he's got Puck to help him. As the beatings go on, the devil comes up with a better idea, and he releases Sabretooth. Logan laughs. <laughs> it looks like you finally found your place in life, Sabretooth. Guess cutting off your head was the best thing that could have ever happened to you, huh? Creed roars, and the devil tells him, that's enough. I have something else I would like to show you, Logan. More demons show up carrying someone, and as they get closer, Logan sees the silver samurai. The devil says that Harada here would like to tell him a few things, and Harada looks up, stating that it's because of him. This is all because of him. And then his head flies off. The devil picks up the head and crushes the body with his sword. He then holds the sword to Logan's face, telling him that this is the soul cutter. Wounds from a never heal. So either you break or I'm gonna cut you into little pieces. Logan looks at him and spits in his face. The devil roars and slices down, cutting off Logan's ear. And he tells the demons to go ahead and nail Logan to something for a few thousand years. While Logan is taken away back up top, Mystique leads Damon to where Logan was taken away. 
Melita says that it was her, wasn't it? The one who lured Logan here. And Mystique tells her, yeah, there were some powerful people that hired her, and she doesn't want to be a part of it anymore. Damon tells Melita that Mystique is telling the truth, at least on where it happened. But there is one thing that he wants her to understand. If they fail in their attempts to exercise the demon out of Logan's body, they could be spending an eternity in agony beyond imagining. Is that something that she is ready for? Back down below, Logan stands nailed to a cross when he hears a voice. Puck tells him that he's looked better, and Logan asks, what are you doing here? Puck explains, right now, if you want out, you need to keep holding out. The demons here are wanting to take over the throne there, and every time you defy them, the devil's grip loosens. So no matter what, don't break! Puck then leaves, and Logan hangs, planning his next move. His arms begin to flex, and he screams as he pulls the nail out of the board in his hand. The demons all start chanting for Logan to fight, and the devil asks, What the hell is going on? Soon the bodies begin to fall from the sky, and the devil looks up to see Logan ripping the wings off of the flying demons. And the devil shouts, That is enough! It is time to end this. Logan tells him, talk is cheap, bub, so you better show me. And the two charge at each other. As they meet, they begin to swing and slash away at each other. And as the fight goes on, the devil cuts and slices into Logan, knocking him down. He then holds out his sword, telling him, this is goodbye. And Logan says, at least you proved one thing. That's that even the devil can bleed. Dripping off of Logan's claws is green blood. And the devil notices the cut on his face. The demons begin to rally. And Logan jumps up, punching the devil. Puck and the tall man watch. And the tall man says that it looks like like things are at their tipping point. Puck tells the man that after that, he's gonna get out of here. Meanwhile, up on top of the X-Men's Utopia, the possessed Logan begins his assault, attacking Colossus first. Colossus knocks him down, telling him, I would rather not have to hurt you. And Logan says, you must not know much about demons, huh? Speaking of, where is the little hell tease of a sister? Maybe she can enlighten you. Colossus grabs him and throws him back down to the ground, telling him, you will not speak of her. And then after throwing Logan out of the building, Colossus tells Kitty to go and get Scott. Before she can leave, Logan crashes back down, knocking Colossus through the floorboards. Logan stands there with his claws dripping with blood, telling him, look, there must be something soft and squishy inside. The other X-Men run into help, and as Iceman gets close, Logan breathes fire all over him. Angel runs up, but as Logan walks past him, his eyes begin to bleed. Logan walks back over to Colossus and he tells him, when I took this body, I made a pact to kill everything that Logan has ever loved. So now it's time to die. Back in hell though, Logan continues chipping away at the devil, making cuts all over his face. And with one last attack, the devil pushes Logan down, breaking his bone claws. After pushing him down, the devil picks him back up and that's when he hears something. A sudden roar from behind the devil approaches and he asks, who dares? The demons that swarm around him. Topside, Mystique and the Ghost Riders head into Utopia to find the possessed Logan standing over Colossus' dead body, and they pull him away. But down below, as the fight continues, Logan grabs a hold of his broken claws, and he uses them to nail the devil's body while the other demons flutter around. Now with the soul cutter out of the devil's hands, the demons begin fighting over the sword, and the devil tells Creed to hurry up and free him. But Creed growls and slashes away. As the demons all fight, Logan looks over and a voice tells him, If you're thinking of joining, don't. The man steps out and says that he would like to have a moment to talk to him. Man to man, father to son. Thomas Logan steps up and tells him, hello, son. Logan tells him that he is not his father, but Thomas tells him, I'm not mad at you for killing me and sending me here. It just took some years to figure out what you really were. But with all of this that is going on, me and Puck set it up. All I wanted to do was tell you that I'm proud of you. Topside, Mystique and one of the Ghost Riders drags the possessed Logan to the church that Damon told him to bring him to. And as they ride, Logan stabs his claws into the road, and he pulls back on the chain. The Ghost Riders fall off the bike, and Mystique sprays him with a holy water mace. The Ghost Rider runs in, punching and headbutting, but Logan leans back, grabbing the skull and tearing it off of his body. He then takes the flaming skull, and he throws it at Mystique and stabs into her. Logan looks down, telling her, We are not the same Logan as you once knew. And Mystique tells him, it's true. You're stronger and faster, but you're still just as stupid. The other Ghost Rider blazes through, grabbing Logan's hand and flings him into the church. As his body tumbles and rolls in, Damon looks at him and tells him that it's time to send his ass back home. Back down below in hell, Logan says that he can't believe what he's hearing. And Thomas tells him, just believe it. Now go out there and be the son that you were born to be. Over in the crowd of demons, Creed grabs a hold of the Soul Cutter, and then he charges in after Logan. Using his broken claws, Logan stabs into Creed's neck, and the two of them begin to struggle over the Soul Cutter. Cutter. Logan bites into Creed's ear and he rips it off his body, and then he takes the sword from his grip. Holding the sword, he tells Creed, this sword will make it so the wounds don't heal anymore. So, with one swing, Creed's head rolls off. Everyone watches stating no, but Thomas watches stating yes. We will all now bow before the new Lord of Hell. 
Thomas walks over to his son, telling him, You've done it. Hell is yours. Hell is ours. Together. And as Thomas reaches out to Logan, Logan tosses the sword back into the crowd of demons. Thomas shouts, You had it! You pathetic coward! And Logan turns back, punching Thomas Logan in the face. As Logan walks off, his father watches, stating, You'll be back. Some of the demons start to surround Puck, and Logan steps in with the barred flail, and the two start fighting the crowd back. As they clear a path to the wall, Logan and Puck begin to climb the walls of hell. And then Logan sees Mariko. Inside her cell, she wishes him speed on his journey, and Logan looks at her, telling her, That's crazy. You're coming too. She responds by telling them that they had their time together. This is where she belongs until she can redeem herself. So go. Logan reaches out to her, but Mariko tells him to just go. Don't look back. And Logan and Puck continue climbing as the demons beg to be let out. As they climb, one demon reaches out, grabbing Puck and pulling him back down. Logan tries to catch him, but Puck shouts for him to keep going. Logan climbs on, thinking to himself that the man down there, he is every bit his son. A killer. A walking, talking tragedy. And soon the light begins to shine, and the possessed Logan screams out in pain. Everyone looks at Logan's body, and Melita asks if it's working. She leans in, asking Logan to say something. But instead of an answer, Logan gets up and runs. Damon says that Logan's mind is still in turmoil. They need to catch him. And as they walk out, a voice tells them, I'm not sure what the hell is going on. And that's when everyone sees Logan stopped by Scott. And he tells them, but this ends now. both Damon and his Ghost Riders, along with Scott and the others. Logan tries to regain control over his body. Melita slowly steps forward, asking if he's alright. And as she does, the demons take over and they slash away at Melita's arm. Logan struggles, telling her, you need to run. Just go! But soon the demons begin to take over once again and they shout, there will be no more talking from him. And if we can't have the Wolverine's flesh, no one can. The demons begin forcing Logan into stabbing and ripping himself apart. The Mystique then asks, why isn't Logan back to normal yet? And Damon tells her that the spirits possessing him aren't giving up without a fight. Demons can kind of be like that. Scott asks Damon, what is going on? Has Logan killed anyone yet? And everyone remains silent. And Scott asks again. So finally, Mystique tells him, yes. Melita then asks, uh, please, Mr. Cyclops, these men have to finish what they're doing. It's Logan's only hope. But Damon says that he's afraid that they are finished. The spirits have dug themselves in real deep, and now it's up to Logan to fight his way out. Inside of Logan's mind, he begins to wake up in a field asking, where am I? The demon horde looks looks over him telling him, We hope you don't mind, but we've made ourselves at home while you were gone. Logan looks around the field of ash and the demons tell him, We hope you like what we did here. Logan then pops his claws telling them, It's time for you to get the hell out of my head. Outside, everyone watches as Logan continues to struggle within his own mind. And Emma Frost looks in and says that it's like a psychic Armageddon in there. As she looks deep, she screams and falls back, stating, The demons looked at her. It's like a pack of dogs running wild inside of her mind. There were so many different entities in there, far Far more than even she could count, all tearing him apart from the inside. Melita says that he can beat him. They just have to give him a chance, and Emma telepathically tells Scott that even with Logan's mental defenses, he won't last long against those things that are infesting him. Scott tells everyone to give Logan five minutes. Until then, no one touch or get near him. Namor then tells all of the civilians to go on and leave, and points to Damon, telling him, That includes you. Damon says, like hell, I'm leaving. If Logan wins, those demons will scurry out like cockroaches looking for a new place to hide. Places like inside of you. Soon the two groups begin arguing over whether or not they should be leaving, but Melita shouts at them to remember they are here to help Logan. Suddenly everyone begins to hear demonic laughter coming out of Logan. <laughs> And the demons tell them, You all come here to save your friend, but instead, you're going to die by his hand. He pops his claws, and now the claws begin to burn with hell of fire. And Scott tells Damon that if he wants to take point, then be his guest. Logan charges through one of the ghost riders, and he stabs his claws into the next. And Damon tries to stop him with a fire blast, but Logan just turns, grabbing him and throwing him into a traffic light. Scott gives the order for them to go, and Logan continues destroying everything in his path. While everyone gets into positions, Emma Frost tells Scott that he can't not be controlled anymore. He's already killed before and he'll do it again. He would want him to end this. Scott radios to Magneto and tells him to do it. So Magneto begins to lift Logan, stating that he will try and make this quick. And Logan begins to scream! Inside Logan's mind, the demons begin destroying and setting everything on fire. His memories begin to burn as he runs through a graveyard where he buries his regrets. And then there's one place that the flames haven't reached yet. A place where he will make his final stand. Logan makes his way inside and he suits up. But if he's going to stand a chance, he needs to let them out. He needs to let them all out. The demons begin forcing their way in, and Logan tells the rest of himself that if they die, they will die as one. And then all at once, Logan's inner personalities begin to tear through the demon horde.
Horde. Back on the outside, Magneto begins to pull all of the iron out of Logan's body. He tells him that he takes no pleasure in doing this. And Logan tells him, that's too bad, because we certainly will. Logan reaches out, strangling Magneto until he's free. And as Logan begins to walk closer, he tells Magneto, I know you from somewhere, but where? Oh, where? Magneto grabs a sewer lid and breaks it down, shooting all of the shards through Logan's body. And as he lays there, Logan tells him, you were much younger back when we met, but where? The Demons begin to take off Magneto's helmet, and Logan says, There's gotta be something with that helmet blocking us out. Let me see. Suddenly, Magneto's vision begins to change, and before him stands a Nazi soldier, and the soldier tells him, That's right. This is where we met. Logan tells Magneto, You can sit there and cry now, but where is your other friend? Oh, never mind. Here he comes. Namor charges through the traffic, grabbing Logan and launching the two of them into the sea. Scott and Emma head over to the shore, but as they get closer, Emma says that she can sense the water boiling. Logan is burning Namor underwater. Scott tells her to focus, and then she tells him that it's over. The two watch as Logan gets up onto the water's surface, and he starts walking back towards them. As Scott charges in, he shouts for Emma to go to plan B. He'll hold him off until they get here. So Emma makes a connection with Dr. Nemesis, asking if he copies. Nemesis tells her to quiet down. He can hear her without her shouting into his head, but they're on their way. Nemesis then asks Fantomex if he remembers the plan, and he responds, stating that if he's asking if he knows how to kill a man, he remembers. Back on the ground, Melita holds a gun to Emma, telling her that they're going to help him. They have to help him! And Emma tells her that she knows that this is difficult, but they don't have time to. And then she stopped as Rogue tells Emma that the girl's right. They're going to help Logan. All of them are! Over on the shore, Scott is firing blast after blast into Logan, and as Logan walks through it, he tells Scott, I know your fear isn't about dying. It's about failing. So the sad thing is, this is going to really hurt. Rogue jumps in, turning her hand into steel and punching Logan and telling him, yeah, he's right about one thing. Storm picks up Logan's body and Emma helps Scott back up, stating that they're going to try one last desperate brain read, which means her mind guts could get ripped out. But then again, they wouldn't be very good superheroes if they didn't do something completely insane, right? Just make sure that if she goes brain dead, to pull the plug before her looks go. Storm then throws Logan's body down onto a nearby island and Emma tells everyone that what they're about to do could leave them with their brains scrambled. Rogue tells her that that's fine, just go ahead and take them inside already. Emma says that they're gonna need to keep Logan close by and Storm tells her not to worry about that. She'll keep him in one place. Inside Logan's mind, him and all of his personalities continue to fight a losing battle, but suddenly Logan hears a voice. All of the girls charge in and Emma says, what a surprise, this place smells like a burnt out strip club and it's time for us to get to work. But while the girls charge in and aid Logan in battle, there's another person wandering around inside of Logan's mind. The figure says that Logan will die here unless he opens up one last door, the one that he buried deepest underground. Nightcrawler says that he's sorry for doing this, but this is the only way to save him from hell. And he pushes open the doors that have the Phoenix symbol hanging above them. Outside of Logan's mind, Nemesis and Fantomex arrive, and as they watch Storm, Nemesis says that that's his kind of woman. Fantomex says that perhaps they should focus on the task at hand, but they do have a dear friend to kill. And as they get close, to Storm tells them to get back. She has this under control, interfering to put them at great peril. Nemesis fires his gun, telling her, never mind, she's too bossy for him. And the blast tears part of Logan's face away. So Storm asks him, what are you doing? And Nemesis says, shooting him in the face. She then asks, with what? And he says, a little bubonic plague, mouth cancer, a dash of flesh-eating bacteria back inside. Logan and the rest of them begin to fight off the demon horde. And while killing one demon, Melita tells Logan that she understands why he likes this so much. And Logan tells her, come here. And he kisses her. A Jubilee tells him that's right. But stopping to make out is not really helping out her situation. Rogue calls out that they are losing too much ground and Logan tells everyone to get out. This isn't your fight. But before anyone can move, the ground begins to shake and tear apart. And as the dust begins to settle, everyone finds themselves in different parts of Logan's mind where he's locked things away. Emma looks at a door labeled sexual fantasies. And as she looks in, she says that she knows she's going to regret this. The door opens and Emma sees several women, one of which is her. She then asks where all the demons are at because she kind of needs to die this instant. Jubilee looks at another door and says that this is definitely not what the danger room was meant for. Rogue sees one labeled, How I Cheat at Cards, and she shouts, I knew it! Up in the higher floors, the demons all begin to overwhelm Logan, and through them a person jumps in, cutting the demons away. The arm reaches down to grab Logan and he looks up. And he says, you're. And Nightcrawler tells him, dashing, I know. But more importantly, I'm not alone. Logan looks over and says, it can't be. Everyone gathers around asking, is that? And Jean steps forward telling everyone, this is no time to talk. You all must flee to the safety of your own minds. The only thing that can save Logan's soul is the fire of the Phoenix. 
Jubilee asks if that's the real Jean, and Emma tells her no. It's just a chunk of Logan's subconscious that thinks it's Jean, but it's not really her. Logan tells Jean to get them out of here, and within seconds, the girls begin to wake up outside. As Jean begins taking care of the demon, she tells Logan that even though she's not the real Jean, she's real enough, and the only way to salvage what's left of his mind is to finally let her go. The demons start to grab a hold of Jean, and she tells him there isn't much time. Outside, Nemesis and Phantomex try to keep Logan down, but as he walks through, he spews fire, knocking them away. Phantom Mex says that they should probably never do that again, and Nemesis tells him that he'll drink to that. Back inside, the demons begin bringing everything down, and Nightcrawler says that even though he is dead, he would very much like to not be ripped apart by the demonic hordes. Gene then asks why hesitate, is there a reason that he wishes to live? And Logan looks at the door labeled, people that I have to kill before I die. And he tells her, you bet. Outside, the demons begin to weaken as Scott stands over Logan, telling him that he's sorry. But before he can fire, Logan falls to the ground, stating, Gene! Nemesis shouts for him to fire, but Scott waits. And then the black energy begins to shoot away from Logan's body, and he hears the voices asking if he's okay. Logan gets back up, and he tells everyone, I could sure go for a drink. Feels like my throat's been on fire. Afterwards, he goes to see Colossus over in Utopia to make sure he's doing okay. But before leaving, Melita tells him that he doesn't have to do this, and Logan tells her to just stay here until he gets back. Scott then stops him, asking if he's got a minute. Logan tells him not to worry. He doesn't blame him for what he had to do, and Scott tells him it's not about that. It's about Jean. He said her name just as he was waking up. Logan says now isn't the time for that. It's just something that he doesn't want to be a part of. Back inside of Logan's ruined mind, everyone begins putting things back together. One of the personalities says one of the others said that there's something that they needed to do first before that. And the personality asks who? And the other points at the Berserker personality. The Berserker begins writing something on the wall with blood and then he steps away. And they see Logan's next objective. The word revenge is written there. After tracking down some leads, he managed to find her, but she was already in a battle against the Red Hand's own assassin for betraying them. The three of them clashed, and Lord Deathstrike managed to wound Mystique so that she was unable to escape. With Lord Deathstrike's job done, all that was left was for Logan to kill Mystique, and with one pop of his claws, Mystique's body was left in the street while Logan continued his search for the Red Right Hand. With the information from Mystique and Maverick, Logan's search brought him to a home out in Mexico. He wastes no time ripping the door down and calling out that if nobody wants to die like dogs, they should come out and face him. As Logan walks through, a voice calls out telling him that everyone's right here waiting for him. They all have. Cannonfoot then says that they all got to draw straws to see who would go first, and Logan tells him, You must have lost, huh, bub? As Cannonfoot tells him actually he won, he drops a steel ball down on his foot and he throws it at Logan's head. Cannonfoot then says he's supposed to leave some of him for the others, but he's thinking that maybe he'll just kill him right now. He grabs Logan and he throws him into a wall, all the while the red right hand watches. Some of the members state that this is actually pretty brutal, but the leader tells everyone that they can't look away. They need to remember why they're doing this. The leader, as a young boy, grew up watching his father taking charge of any situation. No matter who it was, he never once lied, and he always beat down anyone who deserved it. Though he was a fair and honest man, he did run into trouble when his workers down in the coal mine went on strike and began to organize a union. The boy's father dealt with the unruly workers, and then they brought in a man, a negotiator of sorts. And that was the day that the boy saw something in his father that he had never seen before. Fear. Fear destroyed the boy's father, and just as he hit rock bottom, the negotiator came and killed him. The boy watched as the negotiator murdered his own father, and then he told the boy that he knows that someday he'll want to try and kill him, but don't. Just move on with his life. The boy didn't. He grew up building back up his father's legacy, and once he managed to put everything back into place, he hunted down that negotiator. The man's name was James Howlett, and now the young man shot and killed James while he was drunk and stumbling in the streets. Except, James didn't die. The young man woke up the next morning bloodied and bruised, and then he put everything in his life on hold to kill James Howlett. Over and over again he tried, each time failing, and that's when he realized that he may be doing this all wrong. He sought out the help of others who had been wronged by James Howlett, and in the current time, the leader, now an old man, watches as Cannonfoot screams in pain, and Logan asks Cannonfoot, what are they gonna call you now without a foot? Logan then turns back to the cameras watching him, and he asks, who else do you have? Suddenly, Logan has cracked across the head, and a woman calling herself the Shadow Stalker, tells him that his blood tastes so sweet that she might freeze it and make popsicles out of it. With a pop of his claws, Logan charges back in, telling her, you could lick these. Shadow kicks Logan before he can get to her, and then whips the spiked flails in her hair, slicing through Logan's neck. He gets back up, blood pouring all over, and Shadow presses herself against him, stating that she thought his claws would be much bigger. 
After smacking him one more time, Shadow leans in, stating that she just wants one kiss to give him a bit of pleasure amidst the suffering. Logan leans in, biting away the side of her face as she pushes him back. And as she does, she notices that Logan has ripped the flails out of her hair and then kicks him back through a door. He gets up and he looks around, seeing that he's in some sort of museum. All of things that belong to him or involved him. Shadow walks through telling him that she hates to break it to him, but she's had better than him, and she charges back in. It doesn't take long as the red right hand watches as Logan kills Shadow and destroys everything that belonged to him. He steps out of the hole shouting, If you're still here, I'm coming for you. Logan continues to make his way through the home until he steps into a room with two others. He tells them to walk away. They don't have to do this. But the man begins to speak in Spanish and the girl asks if he knew that everyone that she's met in her entire life all hated him. He must be like the worst person. The young man readies the saw blades on his fists and the girl takes out knives stating that her name is Fire Knives so he can guess that he's called Sawfist. The two rush into attack, and Logan manages to deflect the first few, but soon the two strike, stabbing at him. Fire then turns to the camera, stating, He's screaming, right? Is that good, or should there be more screaming? Logan pushes Saw back as Fire jumps and stabs into him. And just as Saw moves into attack, Logan breaks the Saw and throws Fire off of him. He pulls the burning blade out of his back and he cuts through it. He then tells Fire and Saw to just walk away. Fire looks up stating that if there's a time to say over my dead body, this would totally be that time. The two stab their weapons into each other and Logan continues on. Back with the red right hand, one of the men shouts that this isn't enough. He needs to suffer like they did. He has to know why! But as the man makes his way through the crowd, the leader tells him that he knows the rules. And and the man is shot in the head. The leader tells everyone that they need to stick to the plan. Let them all remember that. Everyone turns to the camera and sees Logan and he tells them, who dies next? The leader turns to Gunhawk and he tells him, it's up to you now. Hopefully you'll fare better than the dearly departed. Gunhawk pushes open the doors to see Logan standing in the hallway and Logan tells him that his friends talked a big game but that didn't keep them from dying. So what about you? Gunhawk looks at him without saying a word, draws his guns and he begins to fire. Logan walks through the shots and as he gets closer, he slashes away at one of Gunhawk arms. Though Gunhawk manages to get a hit in, Logan rushes forward, stabbing into him and throwing him to the ground. Logan asks, they should be right through that door, right? And as he spits up blood, Gunhawk tells him, yeah, you really shouldn't go through it though. Logan looks down telling him that if there's more like him on the other side, he'll take his chances. Their plan to kill him hasn't exactly worked out yet. Gunhawk struggles, telling him that that's where he's wrong. The plan was never to kill. And inside the room, the leader tells everyone that everything is set. It's time for them to welcome their guest of honor. Back outside, Gunhawk says the plan was only to make him hurt. What's behind the door is a whole lot of that. Before pushing open the door, Logan asks, do I know you were something? And Gunhawk tells him no. You don't know me at all. And then he draws his final breath. Logan pushes open the doors and he says, yeah, a whole lot of hurt is here, and it's coming in right now. Inside the crowd toasts, to revenge! And they all begin to drink, one by one. They then begin to fall, dying from the poison that they just drank. The leader says they will all die well with victory in their hearts, to die with a smile. But before drinking his glass, the leader notices that one of them is not drinking, and he asks, why are you waiting? The young boy says that he wants to see his face when he realizes what they've done. The leader places his hand on the boy's shoulder and he tells him that he understands. But now is not the time for regret. Now is the time for us to rejoice. He then takes his drink and he falls over. Just then, Logan bursts into the room and he sees everyone dead. He walks through and he says, it's a damn shame. Hope they all enjoy hell as much as I did. And then the monitor turns on and the leader says, welcome, Mr. Howlett. If you're seeing this, that means that we are all dead. I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of unanswered questions and why we went to such lengths to make you suffer. Though I regret that I will not be able to tell you face to face, we thought that it would be best to deprive you of the joy of actually killing us. The answers of who we are rest inside of the book that we left behind. And inside it are all of the faces of the people who are precious to us. Fathers, mothers, wives, sons, daughters. We felt that they needed to seek out revenge for the things that you've done, which is why we sent you to hell and attacked those close to you. However, our mission isn't done. In order to get there, we had to kill five people. Those five are known as the Mongrels, and there are also files about them that you may find interesting. Logan begins to open up the folder and he begins to read, and the leader goes on stating, We spent years studying you, some our entire lives, and during that time, we found things that even you may not know. We know everywhere that you've been and everything that you've left behind. Logan tells him, This can't be true. And the leader continues to state, We've searched the globe for these five. We trained them and we knew that they could never win. In fact, we wanted them to lose, to die specifically by your hand. And why would they do that? Because they were his children. 
He then finally tells Logan that now, finally, he is like them. So let him welcome James Howlett to the red right hand. The screen shuts off and Logan drops the book and the young boy looks up laughing, seeing the look on Logan's face as he falls over from the poison. Slowly, all of the members of the red right hand begin to wake up in the burning fires of hell and the leader sees his father and he hugs him, telling him that he finally did it. Everyone starts running to their loved ones and the young boy stands there calling to his mother, but the mother never comes. Now over in Melita's apartment, she asks Logan if the rumors of him leaving San Francisco are really true. He tells her, Actually, I've already left. I just came back here to get a few things and say goodbye. Melita asks if he was ever planning on asking if she'd like to come with him. And so he does, and she tells him that she's not sure. Lately, she's been getting a lot of job offers as a journalist. Logan tells her that he understands there are things out there that they both have to do, and one of them for him is to go back to Westchester and rebuild that school. Melita hugs him, asking how is he going to pay for all of this. He practically lives out of a paper sack. He says that he has money. He just chooses to live this way. As Logan turns to leave, Melita stops him, telling him that even if they're not going to be together for a while, it doesn't mean that he isn't supposed to kiss her. And as they do, Melita notices a young boy staring at them through the window. The boy lets himself in, telling Logan that people were starting to think that the Black Dragon was dead. And Logan tells him that he's been a bit busy. Melita asks who this is, and the boy opens up his vest, showing off his trinkets, telling them that his name is Yoon Yi. Does she want to watch? Diamond earrings? Maybe even a slightly used switchblade? Logan says that this is his friend from China town and Ewan tells her that that's right and now it's time for them to go back there so he can take care of his responsibilities. Logan tells Melita that he'll explain later and Yoon nudges him to hurry up and kiss her. They gotta get moving. A little while later Logan and Yoon walk into the destroyed bar known as the Drunken Mantis and a voice calls out that their esteemed black dragon returns. Logan bows and tells him that he apologizes that he has neglected his responsibility and he humbly resigns his position. Poe tells him oh no 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 you don't get off that easy. You need to go out and clean up this mess. There's a drug war going on even though it doesn't look Look like there is much of one by the scene. There is a new player in the field that no one knows of. Logan starts to look around and Poe goes on to state that these men in these masks came looking for him. But as Logan reaches the back, he sees his safe where he kept all of his money has been broken into. Logan looks back to Poe and he tells him that he needs his money back. And Poe says that he needs his streets back, so Logan grinds his teeth and he tells Poe, Fine, just show me who to stab. Later over in the warehouse in the docks, a guard hears a knock at the door. The man goes to look out the peephole, and then they hear a sound of Logan's claws pop and shoot through the door, stabbing into the man. He then bursts through the door, and he runs through, cutting and ripping apart any guard who even looks in his direction. Poe begins to investigate the warehouse and finds that the whole warehouse is a storehouse for heroin. But the big problem is, how are they moving this massive amount of drugs? Logan looks back at one of the fallen guards, and he asks Poe if he has any idea who these people are. Poe mentions that they do have the mark of the claw on their chest, and Logan says, Claw, as in. He stops and he sniffs the air, and suddenly from the shadows, a giant figure jumps in saying, Claw, as in Jade Claw! Gorilla Man leaps in front of everyone, telling him, I was just about to find out how they were moving this stuff until you showed up. The two begin to argue in each other's face until Gorilla Man starts to beat his chest, roaring. While the two continue to yell at each other and then begin to fight, Poe finds a switch to a secret stairway and tells them that when they decide that they want to be useful, he already found where they all need to go. Gorilla Man says their fight will be continued later, and they all sneak down into the lower levels, where Poe mentions that something is wrong. Yoon asks how could a bunch of drug dealers make a tunnel this big, and Poe tells him that the drug dealers didn't. These red dragons hauling the drugs did. Logan asks how far do these tunnels go, and Poe says all the way back to the motherland. Gorilla Man stops them and asks if this is literally a tunnel to China, because that would be insane, and I'm a talking gorilla. While the group talks, one of the dragons overhears them, and even before they can move, a voice calls out welcoming the Black Dragon. A group of assassins led by Soul Striker steps out from the back, stating that they are grateful that they have saved them the trouble of tracking him down. As all of the assassins move around the group, Gorilla Man asks if it's too late to back out of their team up. Within seconds, fists begin to fly as Logan and Gorilla Man charge in, swinging at anything that moves. Soul Striker punches at Gorilla Man and he asks, Why do they call you that? As Soul Striker's fist punches through his chest and he screams in pain, telling him, Okay, I get it now. A group leaps at Yoon, asking if he's really going to show them his kung fu. So he pulls out a gun and shoots them and tells them, That's right, because all Chinese know kung fu, you racist pig. As everyone continues fighting, one of the dragons leans in and opens its mouth to breathe fire down the entire cavern. While Soul Striker shells to leave their souls for him, Poe leaps in, kicking and punching him. He then looks down, telling him, you have dishonored yourself by using these noble dragons. But as he says that, Soul Striker asks, noble, you say? And a dragon snorts right behind Poe, and Soul Striker tells him, you don't know much about these dragons, then. Moments later, Soul Striker shouts, that's enough, I've captured Poe and Yoon. If you wish for them not to die, then you will stop. 
Logan throws his hands up and tells him, fine, we give up. And Gorilla Man asks, what the hell? Where does that leave us? But after he and Logan are strapped to two dragons ready to be ripped apart, he says, it leaves us here. How silly of me. Logan shouts to Soul Striker that when he gets out of this, he's going to take his other hand. And if he asks nicely, his head too. Soul Striker tosses Poe down into the pit saying, yes. Well, they both seem to be working just fine. So I have other places to go. So even if by some miracle you get free, you can have fun wandering these caves until you starve to death. After Soul Striker and the rest of his group leaves, the two dragons begin walking apart and Logan shouts to Gorilla Man to hurry up. Gorilla Man finishes untying his feet and says, having opposable big toes, huh? Bet you wish you had them right now. As Gorilla Man unties Logan's arms, the one dragon holding them begins running off, dragging them both behind it. But then the dragon suddenly stops after something punches it. A voice calls out that at long last, someone has come to rescue him. He welcomes them with a hug of a thousand thanks. Fat Cobra steps out and says, hopefully you have brought me food. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the caverns, Yoon looks out at the vast poppy fields, asking if that is really a poppy field in the center of the earth. Jade Claw tells him, actually, it's a field the size of Australia. Chinatown is but the first inroad, but soon the world will pay my price for the privilege of buying my drugs. So while everyone fights amongst themselves up top, she will stay down here and rule the world from down below. And Yoon says, actually, that's a pretty awesome plan. Maybe reconsider your whole concubine thing you got going on then? Back with Logan, Fat Cobra grabs Logan and squeezes him for a hug shouting, my old friend has come to save me. After letting him go, Logan looks at Fat Cobra and he asks if he knows him. And he tells him, of course, I am Fat Cobra, though you may not recognize me due to practically fading away into nothing down here. Gorilla Man then asks, how did he get lost down here? And Fat Cobra tells him, the oracles of Peng Lao warned me of a deep trouble within the earth and I got lost on my way down. Since I got lost, I've been reduced to a diet of cave moss and warm puddled water. And three days ago, an entire dragon, but come, if we can make it out of here, we have all the food, wine, and wenches that we could ever want. As the three move on, they see three dragons pass by, and Gorilla Man says that if there's a base in this maze, they might be the key to leading them right to it. Without a word, Fat Cobra jumps out shouting to the dragons, PREPARE TO BE EATEN! And Logan and Gorilla Man soon follow. While they all battle against the giant dragons, Logan says that he has an idea of how they can get into their base, but they might not like it. A short while later, the three dragons make their way back towards the Jade Claw Palace, when suddenly from one of the dragon's stomachs, a man vomiting can be heard. And from another stomach, Logan asks, what was that? And Fat Cobra shouts that he just just ate a part of an apple that he found in here and it did not seem to sit well. Oh hey, there's another apple. The three dragons walk through the gates to the hidden base and Soul Striker stops them shouting, what are you doing? You're all a bunch of lazy bloated beasts. And all at the same time, the three dragons vomit onto him. Through the bile, Gorilla Man says, I'm not sure who to kill first, the bad guys are Logan. Logan pops his claws and says, it might be best to go with them. After getting up from the pile of dragon stomach fluid, Gorilla Man asks, what's the plan? And Logan says, a bunch of stabbing. So Gorilla Man tells him, right, bravo. Bravo plan, General Patton. Soul Striker shouts for everyone to get them with the three quickly jump into battle. Out in the fields, the guards all look around the palace to see what's going on, and Yoon knocks one down with a sack of poppies. He then takes a gun and fires at the rest of the guards, telling the other slaves to follow him to freedom. Though a word of warning, the economy up top really sucks, so being an opium slave might be a better job. When Gorilla Man runs and knocks everyone around him out, Fat Cobra tells him that his monkey style needs work, to which Gorilla Man tells him, you can kiss my ass. Through the crowd, Soul Striker tells everyone to leave Logan alone. He will kill him alone. And Logan says, it's nice to know that you care that much about me. Soul Striker tells him, I'm gonna beat your soul into a quivering pulp. Logan laughs, take your best shot, bub. Soul Striker pulls his arm back as it begins to glow and he punches straight through Logan's chest. He then steps back in pain asking, how are you still standing? Logan tells him, I may have toughened up a little bit since we last met. That, and I've been through a whole hell of a lot of bad things. So some one-armed joker who hits like a girl isn't doing any damage. As the fight goes on, there's a sudden blast of fire covering the entire area and everyone looks up to see the dragons and Soul Striker tells him to hurry up and kill them. Ewan suggests that maybe they should offer the dragons the fat guy so that they can escape. But then there's a second blast and instead it hits Soul Striker. Everyone looks back up to see Poe riding on a gray dragon and he shouts, that's right, Master Poe yet lives and no thanks to you. After the dragons all finish torching the ground, Logan and Poe walk up to a smoldering Soul Striker and Logan tells him, Jade Claw's finished. Bet I reckon you know what's coming next. With one quick slice, Soul Striker's remaining arm flies through the air and Logan says, you've punched your last soul. Poe stands before Soul Striker and he tells Poe, surely you wouldn't hit a man with no arms, right? And Poe says no. So he kicks him in the face. 
back topside, everyone sits in a bar, and Poe finishes the story saying how he said, but I'd kick the living crap out of him. Everyone at the bar laughs and drinks, and Logan asks Poe how is it that he escaped. Poe says that, well, he fell into the Earth's molten core where he landed in a dragon nest. Gorilla Man stops him, telling him that he's going to need another beer if he's going to listen to this. And at another table, Fat Cobra asks Yoon what kind of perks does being the Black Dragon include? And if he's unclear, by perks he means wenches. As Logan drinks his beer, he asks Gorilla Man what happened to Jade Claw, and Gorilla Man smiles, telling him, Oh, last time I saw her, she was on her way back to China, being chased by a few dragons. A voice then asks Logan if she can buy him another round, seeing as how she's now employed. Logan looks up at Melita and says, Daily Bugle now, huh? And she says, yeah. Funny thing is, she never applied to them. He then says, that's really strange. Must have been one of her admirers who submitted her resume then. Melita goes back to look around at all of the people and says that she can tell that he got his money back. But dare she ask who all of these people are? Logan says that he would prefer she not, and Melita says that there's a gorilla drinking. Are gorillas even supposed to drink? Logan laughs, telling her that he's not sure, but they're gonna let him. Elsewhere, though, three figures all stand before a board full of pictures, and one says that the pieces are all falling into place, while another says, yeah, but in all the wrong ways, sadly. The last one says, for one, a lot of people are being killed, and they're going to have to swallow their pride and face the last guy on Earth that they ever wanted to see again. Our tale begins in Japan as Logan looks down at Harada's grave and the voice of Yuriko tells him that they buried him where he fell. Logan tries to say that he's sorry, this is his fault, but the ones who did this all, burned the buildings, killed the silver samurai, took her legs, they were the red right hand, right? And now they're all dead. Logan tells her yes, and Yukio says, then there's nothing to whine about, so come, we have much to discuss. As the two make their way through the destroyed village, Yukio says that she assumes that he's come back because of the war. With the Silver Samurai's death leading the clan Yashida leaderless, the Hand and the Yakuza have moved in. With the Hand assassinating the Supreme Godfather of the Yamaguchi Gumi, Takenaka, war is inevitable. Soon Yukio opens up the door and she says that this is the ancestral fortunes of Clan Yashida, the secret treasure of the Silver Samurai. Logan looks around telling her, it's impressive, and I take it you know that we're being followed, right? Yukio tells him that she may be paralyzed, but she's not deaf. This is just the quickest way to draw them out. Logan is suddenly blown away, and once he gets back up, him and Yukio begin slaughtering the attackers. 82 seconds later, as Yukio kills the last of them, she says that this always puts her in the mood. How about they go around the block once for all time's sake? She does have some feeling below the waist. Logan ignores the question and says, surely the treasure hunt isn't the only thing that they were after. And Yukio says that's right, they were hoping to find a clue on Harada's heir. She read the will. The Silver Samurai had a son. Logan asks where he can find the kid. Yukio tells him that she's a bit hesitant in telling him because it answers another question that he hasn't asked yet. Elsewhere, Amiko, Logan's adoptive daughter, tells Shin that she's really not sure what they're doing here. Shin tells her that it's simple. They're breaking into the most sophisticated corporate laboratory in all of Tokyo with secrets so coveted that they allegedly used assassins as security guards. Amiko asks why exactly is she helping him with a crazy and highly illegal plan? And he says that because she's his girlfriend. And she has to admit that it sure beats the hell out of dinner and a movie. A short while later, Shin bursts out of the wall of the lab, stating that he's got the power source, and now he can finally power his suit. As Shin asks Amiko how she's doing, he quickly realizes that she was captured by the laboratory security. Meanwhile, over in a restaurant in another part of town, a woman leads a few Yakuza to a table, saying that he will see them now. The man at the table asks what is it that he can do for them, and one man says that they have come with a business proposal. The man says that's funny, last time he checked, him and the Yakuza weren't exactly on the same side. And the man continues stating, one million in cash. Someone will be waiting for him at the Los Angeles airport in 12 hours. The man then says that he's starting to like it here. This Kobe beef sure is something. Besides, there's a meeting planned tomorrow, and his boss sure would be sore if he missed it. The Yakuza then pull out all of their guns, telling him that that's not good enough. And Victor Creed asks, are you sure you don't want some of this beef? They can carve off whatever you want. The next day at the Los Angeles International Airport, a Yakuza member reports that the deal is done. Creed just walked away with the money. Back in Japan, a Yakuza boss hangs up the phone stating that the animal Sabertooth has been dealt with. So if the hand has the guts to show themselves, they'll shoot them as many times as their stupid ninja faces want. Just as the meeting begins, there's an opening at the temple doors and a young man steps through stating that he hopes he isn't late. One of the Yakuza asks, who the hell is this guy? And the young man says, Azuma Gota and he'll be representing the hand today. Another Yakuza says that they don't deal with lackeys, where's Wilson Fisk? And Gota says, probably stuffing his face, but I'm the man that you want to talk to. Oh, and I was the one who had your boss take Naka thrown out of a plane in midair. I was the one who started this entire war. So if there isn't any more questions, can we get started?
Elsewhere on the road to the meeting, Logan rides his motorcycle when suddenly he crashes through a wire trap, shredding his bike, leaving him hanging. From behind the trees, Creed walks out saying, You know, this sounds crazy, Logan, but someone swore up and down that you would become a school teacher. Now, if you're teaching, what the hell kind of class would you be qualified to teach? Creed then hits the switch on his jetpack, stating, It's always been a pleasure, runt. And he takes off. As Creed heads over to the meeting, he reports to go to that Logan has been wily coyotied, and he'll be there in about 30 seconds. Back at the temple, as the Yakuza all point their guns at him, Gota tells him, It's fine, take your time. As the call ends, Logan jumps off of a cliff, tackling into Creed, telling him, You're gonna wish you stayed dead. Back at the temple, one of the Yakuza bosses tells Gota that he must be the worst ninja that there ever was. They will be sure to kill him and mail his bits back to Wilson Fisk. Gota says that he rather likes his bits where they are, and hello, bits have been threatened. So that's the cue. Suddenly, hand and ninjas jump out of the ground, and Gota shouts, Yes, wet your swords. Death to the Yakuza. Long live the hand. In the tunnels below the temple, more ninjas run to attack, and suddenly both Logan and Creed are pushed down. With the fighting between the Yakuza and the Hand as well as Logan and Creed, one of the Hand ninjas tells Gota that it would be wise for him to get to safety. Gota says that that's ridiculous, he isn't going anywhere until the Guest of Honor shows up. And next to him, the captured Yamiko tells her, My dad is going to kill you! And Gota says that it's not her father that he's interested in. As a wall explodes, Gota says, there's our man. I was hoping your boyfriend would show up. Just wasn't expecting such an outlandish getup from the son of the Silver Samurai. A few moments go by and Shin begins to rip through a group of ninjas and Gota says that it's almost a shame that they have to kill him. Notice how I said almost? So why isn't he dead yet? Amiko yells for Shin to run, but her cries pierce through the killing and Logan asks, is that Amiko? Creed slashes into Logan's back, telling him to keep your head in the game. And then he lunges in for another attack, with Logan jumping over him, telling him, See, that's the difference between the two of us. And then he stabs Creed in the back and punches one of his claws into Creed's head, telling him, I actually have something to fight for. While Gota watches Shin kill more ninjas, Amiko says that his ninjas really suck. And then she wraps her chains around his neck. Shin shouts that they need to get out of here, but as Shin gets closer to Amika, Logan charges in shouting for Shin to stay the hell away from my daughter. As he tackles into Shin, Amiko shouts, you idiot! Suddenly she's picked up by her chains by Creed, and he tells her to keep her hands off the boss. He still owes me my money. Meanwhile, Shin tries to rock it off, but Logan clings to him as they crash outside, telling him that you should never have dragged my daughter into this, pal. Shin says that she is not his daughter, and he is not his pal. And Logan says, fine, who the hell are you then? Shin says that his name is Shingen Harada. His friends call him Shin, but you can call him the Silver Samurai. Logan swings, stating that he can't just put on a costume and call himself a samurai. It doesn't matter who his daddy is. As Shin blocks the hits, he says that he loves how he's getting a lecture on his own culture from an American. Logan charges in, telling him, I'm Canadian! And Shin tells him, that's even worse! Shin tries to punch Logan back into the woods, telling him, just go back to Canada! And as Logan gets up, he throws a tree trunk, knocking Shin down. Logan runs back in, telling him, this isn't a kid's game that we're playing. And Shin jets down, kicking Logan into a tree, stabbing him in place, telling him, I grew up a long time ago. Power begins to gather around Shin's fist, and then a giant purple explosion goes off, leaving nothing but ash in its wake. As Shin gets back up, a katana cuts through the smoke at a smoldering Logan, Steps out telling him, You may think you're all grown up, but there's plenty of growing up that is yet to be done. Back at the temple, Gota shouts and just forget about the girl and kill the samurai. Logan and Shin hurry back to the main fight, and Logan knocks him away, telling him, You might want to get into a new line of work and also get a new girlfriend. As Logan goes back to killing more hand ninjas, Shin gets up telling him, I can see why my dad always hated this guy. Then Creed stands over him telling him, Well, well, looky at what we have here. After picking up Shin, Gota tells the Yakuza, I suggest you go and bury your dead while you still have people to do the digging. And then a cloud of smoke covers them. The Yakuza open fire, and as the smoke fades, Gota, Creed, and Shin are all gone. Later that night, Logan, Yukio, and Amiku all go to the hospital while Amiko says they need to find Shin. Logan tells her not to worry, they will, but as they come up to a man in a bed, Logan asks, Who's this and how the hell is he gonna help us find the hand? Yukio says that this is Momoru, and according to her records, he's been in a coma for five years. Logan pops a claw. Five years, huh? Looks like we need to give him some motivation to wake up. Logan cuts the tube connected to him and tells everyone not to touch him. Nurses rush in saying that they need to help him or he'll die. And Logan tells them, nah, I don't think so. A few moments later, Mamoru jumps out of his bed shouting, You insufferable bastard, I will kill you! Later, atop the hospital roof, Logan and Momura stand armed with katanas and Amiko says that Yukio said that they were supposed to fight. And it's been about 15 minutes. 
Yukio says if that's what she believes, then she is simply not watching. More time passes, and Momoru shouts, IMPOSSIBLE! And Logan bows, telling him that that was a splendid battle. Momoru says, But I just killed you! In 487 moves, you have never beaten me! He then throws his sword down, saying, You just wasted five years of work. I almost had enough to capture the people who have been secretly murdering coma patients. I just needed another two years! Logan tells him, I'm sorry for that, but once I finish my business with a hand, I'll help you. Right now, I need the help of the only ninja who will talk to me. Momoru says that the hand are not ninja. They are the cheapest imitations, slandering a once proud art. The rats of the hand used many places to hide in the darkness, none as much as the Yoshimi tombs. Meanwhile, at the tombs, Gota slices a slit into Shin's neck, stating, I could kill you, but we would still have the problem of the war with the Yakuza for me to deal with. So maybe after I'm done stuffing you with the flesh-eating beetles, you might be able to help me. I'll wait until you're done screaming, of course. Later, outside of the tomb's entrance, Logan tells Yukio, This is it. Are you sure that Amiko was unconscious when we left? Yukio says that she passed her bedroom. She won't be awake for hours. Back in the trees behind them, Amiko says, Duh, like I don't have a gas mask in my bedroom. As Logan and Yukio enter, one of the hand ninjas reports that they are here for the boy. Another ninja says that, and probably they're going to kill most of them as well. Another calls out that they are fools to dare enter the cave of the Mind Ninjas. And Mystique says the only sounds that she wants to hear are the screams of the man who killed her. Once inside of the tombs, Logan sees a flash and tells Yukio to watch out. He then opens his eyes again and he finds himself washed up on the shores of hell. Again. Logan gets up stating, Oh how? And then the devil rides by stating, Hello James, are you enjoying the swim? Logan tells him, This can't be. Am I still in hell? And the devil shouts, There it is! Look at the infernal realization that you have been in hell all along! Logan says, I don't believe it. Was it all a dream? And the devil says, Not entirely. Then Logan's five estranged children walk up telling him, Hello. Meanwhile, back in the real world, Yukio fights back the mind ninja, shouting for Logan to hurry up and get up! As the ninjas surround Yukio, smoke starts to shoot out of the wheelchair, and suddenly she's gone. The ninjas begin to ask where, and then the chair explodes. And that's when Victor Creed and Mystique walk out, stating, She's just one cripple! Go find her! Over in the control room, Shin watches a monitor with Amiko making her way through, and he shouts that if he hurts her, go to stop him, telling him, Yes, yes, you'll perform all sorts of subtly gruesome acts upon each of my bodily cavities. However, what I would like the answer to is a simple question. Shin says that he can't do what he's asking, and Gota says, Fine, me ribbons it is then. Back in the cave, Amiko walks through and suddenly gas begins to fill the area. She calls out that they should just come out. Don't be afraid of a little girl. That's when Amiko sees a giant dragon come out of the smoke and begin roaring. She pulls down her mask, saying that that's the dragon that killed her mother and ruined her life. She's always dreamed that one day it would come back. Back with Logan, the children all begin to eat and bite into his flesh, and Logan asks, Have I been in hell this entire time? I can't think straight. It's like someone's shooting me in the face. Which, in fact, is what Mystique is doing in the real world. Creed says that shooting off his face is seriously one of the sexiest things he's ever seen her do. A few days earlier, Logan remembered back to his training with Rachel, and how sometimes if he finds himself in a mental bind, it's okay to go a little berserker. From the shores, the children say that Logan looks a little different this time, and instead of the regular Logan walking out, it's Berserker Logan. As Berserker Logan tears into the children, the real Logan tears into the hand ninjas. Back with Amiko, the dragon throws her against a wall, and she tells it that she really hopes that she tastes like crap. But before the dragon can bite down, she grabs a rock and stabs it into the dragon's paw. Suddenly, the illusion of the dragon fades, and she sees that the big bad dragon is just a bunch of ninjas in a costume. A bunch of ninjas that she can eat easily kill. Seconds later, Shin rockets by cutting through the ninjas and grabs Amiko, telling her that they just have to get out of here. Amiko says that she was supposed to be rescuing him, and he tells her that the hand doesn't care about him anymore. They're too busy dying. Elsewhere, Gota and Creed strap on their jetpacks, and they escape while Berserker slaughters the ninjas around him. Yukio says that there's no sign of the samurai boy, and Logan tells her he escaped with Amiko. But in the back of Logan's mind, he tells himself that he thought he was in hell, under the influence of the hand, not in his right mind. Now, though, God help him, because he knows exactly what he's doing. And as he kisses Yukio, he says he's going berserk. Back at the Yoshida treasure, Shin cuts into the door, and Amiko asks, what is even going on? Shin tells her that the treasure of the Silver Samurai belongs to him, as does the clan of Yoshida. Gota's voice tells him that he should rephrase that. And Shin tells him, I'm sorry, Amiko. Gota and Creed step in, stating that it belongs to them now. However, 
back in the grave. Yukio rides through on a horse stating that she's sorry that she missed the fight, but wait, why does it smell like there's more than killing going on here? At another part of the graves, Mystique converted back from Yukio's form stating that she wanted to see if her powers are strong enough to fool even Logan's senses, which they did. And even though she just made love to the man who killed her, she's not done screwing with him yet. Over in the States, Wilson Fisk looks at a picture of Gota asking, who's this? A subordinate says that it's Azuma Gota, head of the Tokyo branch, and Wilson stops him saying, was head. I never authorized a war with the Yakuza. Kill him and be sure to send someone good. Over at the airport, Lord Deathstrike picks up his suitcase and he heads to Japan. However, back in the treasure room, Amiko slaps Shin and Creed tells her to forget her. They'll get him another. Go to laugh stating, there will be plenty of women for us all. There's just work to be done. And as of now, the hand is officially dead in Japan. The next morning, Creed reports to Gota that it's done. The Wolverine just killed every last shuriken tossing one of them. Gota looks off his balcony stating, At last, no more fools running around in costumes. No more Wilson Fisk. Now we can finally begin with a hand out of the way thanks to Wolverine killing them all. Creed asks, What exactly are you trying to do now? And Gota tells him, Let me ask a question. Who's the scariest of the villains in the world? Creed thinks about it and says, Obviously me for one but maybe Dr. Doom? There's also that big purple guy who eats planets. Gota tells him, wrong. It's the villains you've never heard of. The ones who are solely in the shadows, yet control and exploit every single facet of life. Instead of me being brought back to life and staying the same, how about we rebuild and transform what the hand used to be? That is assuming our new friend hasn't lost his nerve yet. Down on the highway, Shin says that he can't do this, and Mystique tells him it's just a bunch of bloated Yakuza bosses. He's got the silver samurai armor and the big glowing swords. Also, let her remind him that he doesn't have a choice, because if he doesn't, she'll kill him and take his form and do it herself. Back at Gota's penthouse, Gota hands Creed a paper stating, These are the names of the most secretive assassins. These are the only people that we need to make this work. But our first target is going to be dear old Wolverine. He worked for us, now it's time for him to die. Creed tells him, Looks like you've got all the angles covered. And Gota says, yeah, all but one. And that's for me to become invisible. There's only one real way to do that, isn't there? As the night falls, Gota stands on his balcony as a woman hugs him, telling him to come back to the garden. There are still so many fruits for him to taste. He tells her, I'll be there shortly. I'm just enjoying the beautiful night. A laser is then pointed at his head, and a gun fires, shooting him right in the forehead. Lord Deathstrike scans the body to see if there's any signs of life, and then Gota jumps back up, kicking Deathstrike. As Mystique begins to change back her form, Gota watches, shouting, Why is she fighting back? She's supposed to be playing dead. But on another monitor, Creed says, It looks like that could still be arranged. Wolverine is here. Gota shouts, asking, How could he have found us? And Creed just grins. Creed walks off and Gota chases him. You did this, didn't you? You sold me out! And Creed says, that's one way of looking at it. Another way would be that I really didn't give a damn in the first place. Stepping into the balcony where Mystique and Lord Deathstrike are fighting, Creed says, there's one thing that is different about me coming back to life. I came back for something a lot bigger than you. As he jets off with his jetpack, he tells Gota, by the way, getting stabbed with those claws hurt like holy hell. Seconds later, Logan kicks in the door. Gota turns and fires right into Logan's face. Meanwhile, falling down the building, Mystique and Lord Destra continue fighting when Creed tells them, Hang on! Remember when we all used to be friends, right? A few moments later, Logan looks off of Gota's balcony and says, God, I love this country. And as he walks away, Gota's body hangs over the ledge, blood pouring down the side of the building. Later, back at Yukio and Amiko's home, Yukio tells Amiko that it's okay, there'll be other guys. But through her sobs, she says that she doesn't want a new boyfriend just to kill her old one. However, as Logan packs up to head back to the States, Creed, along with Mystique, Lord Deathstrike, and Shin all begin taking down any and all major players in Tokyo. Just as Logan leaves, he says that he can't help but wonder what he's accomplished here. Yukio tells him that he just wiped out the hand in Tokyo, won a war, but he can always come to visit more often. Logan tells her, this is Japan, I'll always come back. And then Amiko yells for him to wait. She leans out of her room saying, She, uh, just heard the police radio say that there's a robbery. Maybe he doesn't have to leave so soon? Logan looks back, and he smiles. However, Logan's story doesn't end here. It ends in Majapur, at Victor Creed's birthday party where some of the world's biggest villains have gathered. And just as the last of the guests arrive, a bloody bodyguard is thrown through the door and Logan asks, Why is everyone standing around? I thought this was a party. Creed smiles and says, It is now and everyone charges towards Logan. He begins killing everyone at arm's reach, and anyone that's not, he runs over stabbing and impaling them. Just as Logan hacks up Mystique, 
Creed jumps in clawing at Logan's face and Logan laughs. Ha ha ha! I'm sorry I had to crash the party, but it got me thinking. It reminded me of how once a year, you would just call to beat my ass because you could. As Logan stabs into Creed's stomach and he rips the claws out, he goes on telling him, I remember, it's been a rough couple of years, but that's no excuse for forgetting special traditions, which is why I'm here now. As Creed falls to the ground, Logan tells him, Happy birthday from your old pal Wolverine. Now, I'm gonna leave everyone to party. I'll see you all next year. Later that night at the bar, the bartender asks, Would you like to start a tab? And Logan tells him, I sure do. He thinks to himself that this is it. Cold beer in his gullet, football on the TV, and Creed's blood on his hands. Yup, this is it. He went to Westchester to find the Green Jay School for Higher Learning and became its headmaster. However, even with all of that taken care of, there are murders popping up around the US, all with their heads cut open and their brains removed. Over in the Bronx, the officers arrive in the scene of another killing just like the ones that happened across the states. As Lieutenant Granger and Detective Hick look at the bodies, Hicks mentions that it seems that they're in the middle of a nationwide killing spree. As Granger looks at the men having their brains removed, she says that this isn't a killing spree, it's a harvest. And another officer tells Granger that they have a witness. They said that he saw everything from up in his window. As Granger and Hicks head upstairs to see their witness, they see that it's just a young boy. The officer with the boy holds up the picture that he was drawing and he says the boy said it was the picture of the murderer. And on that picture is Logan. Over in a rundown bar in California, a waitress asks Logan if he's ready for another beer. He tells her that he probably shouldn't, but the waitress tells him that the beer here is so watered down another won't kill him. So as the waitress goes on asking where he's from, all Logan can see is everyone there is cut and torn to pieces. He snaps back to reality and says that's the million dollar question. She then asks if he needs a place to stay, and after finishing his beer, he tells her, No, I got places to be. As he walks to his car, he tells himself it's hard to resist that girl's charm. Now more than ever, he just needs to be alone. The problem is, is that there's blood on his hands. Blood that he doesn't remember spilling. He's been blacking out and waking up in strange places, covered in gore and reeking of death. Someone has been sending him out as their personal murder doll, and he knows who's responsible. He just needs to find them. As Logan suits up, he heads over to Dunwich Sanatorium. Dunwich Sanatorium is an abandoned mental facility where many people were changed, and changed for the worse. Hitmen, assassins, were created there. And when the new management took over, things went from bad to just nightmarish. There was a time when he was a resident there. They tried to strip him of his mind. They tried to turn him into their plaything. And things didn't turn out so well for their staff. While Logan begins to go through those old files, he begins to smell something. And as he turns back, he sees a horde of fleshy brain creatures shuffling their way towards him. He says, They must be a little gift left behind for whoever came snooping around. He pops his claws with a schnick, and he tells them, I guess it's time that I open up my presents. The brain creatures all begin to jump into him, but Logan tears through them, spilling their blood and guts all over the place. More and more of the creatures are killed, and more and more appear. The next wave begins to grab everything in reach, scissors, scalpels, anything with a blade to it. The creatures jump and attack, and Logan cuts them down, but one manages to cut into his throat with a knife. He catches himself before falling over, and as he looks back at the creatures, they all begin to change shape, change into things from his past. No matter who they are, or who they were. Logan slaughters them all just the same. Meanwhile, in Westchester, at the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning, Headmaster Kitty Pride and Rachel Summers walk through the halls, trying to figure out where Logan may have gone. But as they talk, a student runs up to Kitty, telling her that there have been some people here who want to see her. And as she leaves, she mentions they look kind of official. Kitty says, oh great, and Rachel stomps her, telling her, that she knows why they're here. As Kitty goes to meet the detectives, the man tells her that he's sorry to bother, but his name is, and she stops him. You're Special Agent Dennis Wells, right? He tells her it's a neat trick, but if she knows that, then she can guess why he's here. With a worried look, Kitty says that she's afraid so. They think that their headmaster is a murderer. Back over at Dunwich Sanatorium, Logan leaves the building covered in the blood of the creature, setting out to find him. But as he does, a small mechanical brain watches, showing a picture of Logan carrying a file on the screen. Dr. Rott tells Nurse Fester to go ahead and turn that off. There's so much work to do here. Watching the boob tube will just rat your brain. 
With the files in hand, Logan heads over to where it all began, the place where Dr. Rot was born. However, when he was born, his name wasn't Rotwell. It was Bentley Newton, and he grew up in the heart of suburban America. This used to be a place where families would come to get away from it all, but now it stinks of mildew and decay. As Logan walks into the old destroyed Newton home, the stink he smells is the worst thing that he has ever come across. But then he sees a man. The old withered man asks Logan if he's here looking for his son. Please tell him why he's here. Please say that he's come to kill him. Logan asks where is he as he looks at the old picture of Rot and his mother, and his father mentions that he couldn't shake his Rotwell heritage, too much of his mother in him. Rot's father goes on stating how he was a creature. After they put him away, they thought that they would never see him again. And then Logan notices something coming from the back of the old man's head. Wires and tubes hang out from a hole in the back of it. He goes on stating, He came back, and he left me like this. Logan asks where he can find his son, and the old man tells him, I'll tell you, but promise you won't leave me like this. And after a short moment, Logan's claws pop, and he sets out. Over in New York, Special Agent Wells visits Malenta Gardner, Logan's ex-girlfriend. Wells says that he's sorry for having her meet them on such short notice, but it involves her boyfriend. Malenta stops him, telling him, ex-boyfriend. But if they think she's going to talk to them, Granger then slides the drawn picture of Logan, telling her that a child watched him kill several men. Melenta says that it's not that she doesn't want to help them, but she hardly knew where he was even when they were dating. Wells leans in and tells her, Look, this is strictly off the record, but the murders we're dealing with are involved in the extraction of brains. Melenta's face turns pale and she tells them, Dr. Rot. Back with Logan, his search has brought him to an old abandoned house in the middle of the woods. Logan begins scouting around and then a voice calls out to him shouting, Would you look at this? Logan turns back to see a giant man with chainsaws for hands and a slender woman with a gun and a small man with a bunch of knives strapped to his chest. Without saying anything, Logan jumps in swinging, thinking about how he knows the large one, Charlie Chainsaws. The other two, well, he'll figure it out when he cuts them down. But just as Logan turns to Bay Leanne, she fires her shotgun blowing off half of Logan's face. While he falls to his knees, Tater jumps on his back, stabbing into him. He leans back and tells them, You can cut me over and over again, but I'll just keep coming back for more. Ain't that? But before he could let him finish, Logan throws his head back, crushing Tater's face, and kicks Baleen's legs out from underneath her. As he gets up, Charlie swings his arm, sawing into the side of Logan's stomach. He screams in pain, swiping back, breaking Charlie's hands, and then he escapes. Tater shouts, Don't let him get away! The three begin to search the woods, but as Tater follows the blood trail left by Logan, he feels blood dripping on his shoulder. Logan leaps from a tree branch, stabbing into Tater. Blood begins to fly as Logan stabs into him repeatedly until he finally disembowels him. Logan stares down, grunting, trying to catch his breath, but through choking on his own blood, Tater tries to whisper something. Dream a dream of pretty prey and blood red as rage. Suddenly, Logan freezes in place. Baleen, Ann, and Charlie run up asking what happened. But as she tells Logan to look at what he's done, he sits there staring into nothing. Later, he begins to open his eyes, and he can hear Rot's voice calling out to him. But he can't move. Inside Rot's gory home, Rot tells him that he's going to help make him remember who he really is. After all, he's a part of the family now! <laughs> Rot then tells him that it seems that he's forgotten his manners. Let him introduce everyone. He already knows Charlie and Nurse Fester. And you've already met Baleen, Ann, and Tater. Though it doesn't look like you've made a good impression on him. Next is dear, dear mother. And finally, the old gentleman is my great, great grandfather, Atremus Nicodemus Rotwell. He was such a huge influence on my life and career. Baleen Ann jumps up asking what they're waiting for. They need to make him pay. Look at what he's done to poor Tater. She pulls out a knife and Rot restrains her, stating, Uh, sister, am I right? He goes on stating, of course, she's not my real sister. She's just a sister that I've always wanted. Even put her personality together myself. Rot then pushes Logan's chair onto a dolly. She's right, though. First, I want to show you around a bit. The world wants strip me of my family name, which you should be familiar with, right? We're so much alike, Logan. He pushes the chair into the next room with a great machine holding hundreds of brains, telling him, This is the new and improved God Brain Machine, Pat Pendant, of course. What I did at Dunwich was just child's play compared to this, but this, this gives you goose flesh, doesn't it? Logan struggles trying to break free, but as he tries to pop his claws, nothing happens. Rot leans in telling him, it's no use. You really have no idea what those fiends at Weapon X put inside your skull. Admirable work, actually. Rot pulls out a giant sheet of paper stating, they placed a code in your mind to make sure that you played well with others, and I correct that code. 
He then says, It's back to business of what you did to Tater. The ranks must be replenished after all. A short while later, Logan is strapped to an operation table with machines hooked into him. He screams out in pain and Rot tells him, It's okay, let it all out. Rebirth is supposed to hurt. So let's give you a little jolt. Another electrical wave passes through and Logan mumbles, Kill you. Rot holds out his arms and Nurse Fester hands him a coat hanger and then Rot begins cramming it into Logan's nose. He tells Logan, You have such an amazing canvas, always blank, ready to be worked on every time I return. After pulling out bits of brain matter, Rot then tells him, Take the flesh puppets, for example. I took brain samples last time I worked on you and that's what created those. After throwing the bloody coat hanger into the sink, Rot says, That should be enough for today. Let's let you get a little rest. After passing out, Logan slowly begins to wake up in a basement full of dead bodies and blood written along the walls. He tries to focus, telling himself that he needs to get out of here. And then a claw pops out. He cuts down the door and he says, I need to kill them all. Who's first? Charlie comes charging down the hall and Logan sinks one fist into his chest, telling him, Oh, you'll do. Then with another swing of his arm, Charlie's head flies off and Logan continues walking. Down the hall, Logan can hear Rot telling his great-great-grandfather that he can't wait to show him what he's making. It's gonna make you strong again. As Mother turns back, she sees Logan and shouts, He's loose! Inside Logan's head, all he can hear are the words, Kill them. Kill them! He yells as he jumps through the air, slashing away at Mother and then Grandfather. As the blood begins to spread on the floor, Logan hears a familiar voice scream, No! He knows that voice, right? As he opens up the door, he sees Nurse Fester holding Melita. Fester shouts for him to stay back, and all the flesh creatures begin to take the shape of everyone he knows. But Logan tells himself, They're not real. I just have to fight my way through it. After cutting everything to pieces, Melita looks at Logan and asks if he's... But he grabs her, kissing her, telling her, Yeah, it's me. In another room, Rot is watching a screen with Logan on it, stating, Isn't that the sweetest? Weapon X programming combined with my own special techniques have breached his mental defenses. But as Logan kisses Melita... Melita begins to change into Bailey Ann. And over the intercom, Rot asks Tater how he's feeling. More like your old self? Logan turns his head back and tells him, Yes, much better. Rot tells him, That's good because you got work to do. We have interlopers coming to crash our little family reunion right about this very second. And outside of the building is Melita with Special Agent Wells as they start to surround Rot's house. Rot tells him, Make sure you murder every last one of them, okay? As the FBI agents begin to make their way towards the house, the chainsaw rips through the doors and Charlie busts out, cutting off the arm of one of the men. Elsewhere, another team calls in to see what's going on, but across them is Bailey and Ann, who asks the agents if they would like to play! Over in the barn, Mother and Nurse Fester hold down Special Agent Wells, and as they struggle, Mother manages to inject him with some medicine. However, outside of all of this, Melita sits and waits in the car, waiting for a word from anyone. She sighs, stating that she wishes he was here. And then she looks back and sees him. But Tater tells her in Logan's body, not really, that old boy is dead. He jumps down onto her and Melita tells him, I get it, you're not Logan. But even with his unbreakable bones, you got some soft bits. And she swings up hitting Tater in the groin and running off. As she runs, Tater calls out, you can't run very far from me. Tater runs through the woods, tearing a path as he goes, and then Melita runs into someone. She looks up and sees Charlie staring at her, and then Bay Lee Ann punches her, asking, Tater, what's taking you so long? Bay Lee Ann then throws Melita to the ground and calls out to Logan. But as Tater lifts his knife, Logan's mind begins to recite, Dream a dream of pretty prey, blood red as rage. Logan's life begins to flash through his mind. The things that he's done, the peoples that he's met, and then there's the pop of claws. He lifts up Baleen's body with those claws and she asks if it's Tater. And Logan tells her, No, nah, your boyfriend's dead. After setting Baleen Ann's body on the ground, Melita asks, Is, is it you? I, I brought help. But Logan turns and walks away without saying a word. Over in the barn, Mother asks what they're going to do with their special agent friend now. As Wells' body is hanging there, Fester says that Rot could benefit from having a mole in the FBI. And then they hear a crash. They turn back to see the shadow of Logan and him stating, You better hope Rot is good at stitching up guts. A short while later, Rot begins to question why there have been no reports, and when he turns and calls out to everyone, here's a voice. Logan tells him, You should be calling for your great-great-grandpa too. Rot turns back to see Logan standing there holding his great-great-grandfather by the throat. He throws the body to the ground, breaking the brain container. And Rot says, Ah, Wolverine! As Logan starts to walk forward, Rot recites the program code to stop Logan again. 
but it isn't working. He keeps saying it and he stops asking, how is it that you anchored yourself mentally? Logan looks at him and tells him, you've had this coming for a long time. And just then the flesh creatures grab Logan and pull him back. While Logan starts hacking away, Rot runs off to the next room telling him that they were just made for each other. Each creature that you kill, you're destroying things that you'll never get back. However, as Logan walks through, Rot tells him, Stop or I'll... But Logan stabs him in the stomach and asks, Do what? Scream? Bleed? Rot tries to tell him, There's more trigger phases! Dozens of them! And Logan tells him, That's enough. Your family is dead and now I'm killing you. With a swing of his arm, Rot's head flies off. A few moments later, the house begins to burn down and Logan carries Agent Wells outside and tells Melita that he'll live. And if they want to talk to him, he'll be at his school. As he tries to walk off, Melita stops him, asking, Shouldn't the two of us talk about this? Logan turns back, telling her, I don't know what to say. I don't remember who you are. A few days later, Logan returns to his school, and as he walks through the halls, he can't see the faces of those that he's forgotten, the things that Rot pulled out of his brain. He can heal his brain, but he can't heal the memories that he's lost. He's pretty sure the things that he's forgotten are going to come around and bite him in the ass one of these days. However, back in the woods... Nurse Fester holds her intestines from falling out as she begins to crank a machine. The machine begins to hum and turn on, and from a giant canister, a fleshy blob falls out. That blob stands up. Rot tells his great-great-granddad, I'm sorry I wasn't able to bring you back, but I'll make you proud one day. First things first, though. Let's dig up everything for the Weapon X program. And there you have it, Wolverine Goes to Hell. Now, before you ask, yes, technically there is a final volume to it, but they completely shift the direction, and they were no longer going on this trail of him trying to make amends for his past. In the final volume, it was a completely different story, hopefully starting up something new, but they ended up canceling this Wolverine run and starting up something new afterwards. So this is as far as we intend to take the Wolverine Goes to Hell volume saga, because as you could tell from the beginning to the ending, it almost had a completely different tone, a completely different direction. It didn't. It was going in a weird... It was a lot of him fixing up his old stuff, but overall, it was just weird the direction it took. But I hope you guys enjoyed this long series of Wolverine storylines. And uh, I hope we'll see you next time right here. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing to the channel. And I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.